5. Winter. The sky was already fading into gray when Alex finally made it back to old campus. She'd stopped at the hutch to shower with verbena soap beneath a hanging censer filled with cedar and palo santo, the only things that would counter the stink of the veil. She had spent so little time in leafy places by herself. She had always been with Darlington, and she still expected to see him tucked into the window seat with a book, expected to hear him grumble that she'd used all of the hot water. He'd suggested leaving clothes there and at I.L. Bastone, but Alex already had so little to wear that she couldn't afford to stash an extra pair of jeans and one of her two bras somewhere other than her ugly school-issue dresser. So when she stepped out of the bathroom into the narrow dressing room, she had to opt for Lethe house sweats, the Lethe spirit hound embroidered at the left breast and right hip, a symbol meaningless to anyone but society members. Darlington's own clothes still hung there, a barber jacket, a striped Davenport college scarf, fresh jeans neatly folded and creased, perfectly broken in engineer boots, and a pair of Sperry top siders just waiting for Darlington to slip into them. She'd never seen him wear them, but maybe you had to have a pair in case your preppy card got pulled. Alex left a green desk lamp burning at the hutch. Dawes wouldn't like it, but she couldn't quite bear to leave the rooms in darkness. She was unlocking the door to the Vanderbilt entryway when a text arrived from Dean Sando, have confab W. Centurion. Rest easy. She wanted to throw her phone across the courtyard. Rest easy? If Sando intended to handle the murder directly, why had she wasted her time and her coin of compulsion visiting the crime scene? She knew the dean didn't trust her. Why would he? He'd probably been up with a cup of chamomile tea when he got the news of Tara's death, his big dog asleep on his feet waiting by the phone to make sure nothing went horribly wrong at the prognostication and Alex didn't humiliate herself or Lethe. Of course he wouldn't want her anywhere near a murder. Rest easy. Everything else went unsaid. I don't expect you to handle this. No one expects you to handle this. No one expects you to do anything but keep from drawing unwanted attention until we get Darlington back. If they could find him if they could somehow bring him home from whatever dark place he'd gone. In less than a week they'd attempt the new moon rite. Alex didn't understand the specifics, only that Dean Sando believed it would work and that, until it did, her job was to make sure that no one asked too many questions about Lethe's missing golden boy. At least now she didn't have a homicide to worry about or a grumpy detective to deal with. When she entered the common room to find Mercy already awake, Alex was glad she'd stopped to shower and change. She had thought college dorms would be like hotels, long hallways pocked with bedrooms, but Vanderbilt felt more like an old-fashioned apartment building, full of tinny music, people humming and laughing as they went in and out of the shared bathrooms, the slamming of doors echoing up and down the central staircase. The squat she'd shared with Len and Helai and Betya and the others had been noisy, but its sighs and moans had been different, defeated, like a dying body. You're awake, Alex said. Mercy glanced up from her copy of To the Lighthouse, its pages thick with pastel sticky notes. Her hair was in an elaborate braid, and instead of bundling up in their ratty afghan, she'd thrown a silk robe patterned with blue hyacinths over her jeans. Did you even come home last night? Alex took a chance. Yeah. You were already snoring. I just got up to get a run in. You went to the gym? Are the showers even open this early? For crew and stuff. Alex wasn't actually sure this was true, but she knew Mercy cared less about sports than just about anything. Besides, Alex didn't own running shoes or a sports bra and Mercy never asked about that. People didn't go looking for lies that didn't have a reason, and why would anyone lie about going for a morning run? Psychos. Mercy tossed a stapled stack of pages at Alex, who caught them but couldn't quite bring herself to look. Her Milton essay. Mercy had offered to give it a red. Alex could already see the red pen all over it. 
How was it? she asked, shuffling into their bedroom. Not terrible. But not good, Alex muttered as she entered their tiny cave of a room and stripped out of her sweats. Mercy had covered her side of the wall in posters, family photos, ticket stubs from Broadway shows, a poem written in Chinese characters that Mercy said her parents made her memorize for dinner parties when she was a kid but that she'd fallen in love with, a series of Alexander McQueen sketches, a starburst of red envelopes. Alex knew it was partially an act, a construction of the person Mercy wanted to be at Yale, but every item, every object, connected her to something. Alex felt like someone had come along early and snipped all of her threads. Her grandmother had been her closest link to any kind of real past, but Estria Stern had died when Alex was nine. And Mira Stern had grieved her but she'd had no interest in her mother's stories or songs, the way she cooked or prayed. She called herself an explorer, homeopathy, allopathy, healing gemstones, cryon, spirit science, three months when she'd put spirulina in everything, each embraced with the same fierce optimism, dragging Alex along from one silver bullet to the next. As for Alex's father, Mira was hazy on the details, hazier when pushed. He was a question mark, Alex's phantom half. All she knew was that he loved the ocean, that he was a Gemini, and that he was brown, Mira couldn't tell her if he was Dominican or Guatemalan or Puerto Rican but she did know he was Aquarius rising with his moon in Scorpio. Or something. Alex could never remember. She'd brought few objects from home. She hadn't wanted to return to Ground Zero to pick up any of her old stuff, and the belongings in her mother's apartment were little girl things, plastic ponies, rosettes made of colored ribbons, bubblegum-scented erasers. In the end, she'd packed a hunk of smoky quartz that her mother had given her, her grandmother's nearly illegible recipe cards, an earring tree she'd had since she was eight, and a retro map of California, which she hung next to Mercy's poster of Coco Chanel. I know she was a fascist, Mercy had said. But I can't quit her. Dean Sando had suggested Alex purchase a few sketchbooks and charcoal too, and she dutifully placed them atop her half-empty dresser as cover. Alex had tried to choose the easiest subjects possible, English lit, her Spanish requirement, an introductory sociology course, painting. She thought at least English would be easy because she liked to read. Even when things had been really bad in school, she'd still been able to fake her way through those classes. But this English was an entirely different language. She'd gotten A.D. on her first paper, with a note that said, This is a book report. It had been just like high school, except she'd actually been trying. I love you, but this essay is a mess, said Mercy from the common room. It would probably be better if you spent less time working out and more time working. No shit, thought Alex. Mercy was going to be in for a real surprise if she ever asked Alex to jog somewhere or lift something heavy. We can go through it over breakfast. All Alex wanted was sleep but going back to bed didn't seem to be the thing people did after a run, and Mercy had done her the courtesy of editing her awful English paper, so she definitely needed to say yes to breakfast. Lethe had provided Alex with a tutor, an American Studies grad student named Angus who spent most of their weekly sessions bent over Alex's work, snorting in exasperation and shaking his head like a horse plagued by flies. Mercy wasn't exactly gentle, but she was a lot more patient. Alex yanked on jeans and a t-shirt, then the black cashmere sweater she'd prized so much when she'd picked it out at Target. It was only when she'd seen Lauren's lush lavender pullover and foolishly asked, what is this made of, that she'd understood there were as many kinds of cashmere as there were of cush, and that her own sad sweater pulled from the sale rack was strictly stems and seeds. At least it was warm. She gave her coat another spray of cedar oil in case any veil stink lingered, hefted up her bag, hesitated. She opened her dresser drawer and dug around in the back until she found the little bottle of what looked like ordinary eye drops. Before she could think too much about it, 
she tilted her head back and squeezed two drops of basso belladonna into each eye. It was a stimulant, a strong one, a bit like magical Adderall. The crash was brutal, but there was no way Alex was going to make it through the morning without a little help. The old boys of Lethe had all kept diaries of their time in the society, and they had plenty of tricks they used to cut corners. Alex had discovered this one after Darlington was gone. Back into the morning cold with Mercy beside her. Alex always liked the walk from old campus to the J.E. dining hall, but the quad looked less beautiful with a gray day on it. At night, the grubby packs of snow gleamed vague and white, but now they were grimy and brown at the edges, heaps of dirty sheets ready for the wash. Harkness Tower loomed over it all like a melting candle, its chimes sounding the hour. It had taken Alex a few weeks to realize why Yale looked wrong to her. It was the complete lack of glamour. In L.A., even in the valley, even on its worst days, the city had style. Even Alex's mother, in her purple eye shadow and chunks of turquoise, even their dumpy apartment with its shawls over the lamps, even her no-money friends, gathered at backyard barbecues, recovering from the night before, girls in tight shorts, midriffs bare, long hair swinging to the small of the back, boys with shaved heads or silky topknots or thick dreads. Everything, everybody, had a look. But here the colors seemed to blur. There was a kind of uniform, jocks in backward baseball caps and long loose shorts they wore regardless of the chill, he's on lanyards that they swung like dandies, girls in jeans and quilted jackets, theater kids with crests of sink-dyed Kool-Aid-colored hair. Your clothes, your car, the music pumping from it, were supposed to tell people who you were. Here it was like someone had filed down all of the serial numbers, wiped away the fingerprints. Who are you? Alex would sometimes think, looking at another girl in a navy peacoat, pale face like a waning moon beneath a wool cap, ponytail lying like a dead animal over her shoulder. Who are you? Mercy was an exception. She favored wild florals paired with a seemingly endless parade of eyeglasses that she wore on glittery strings around her neck and that Alex had yet to see her use. Today she'd opted for a brocade coat embroidered with poinsettias that made her look like the world's youngest eccentric grandma. When Alex had raised her brows, Mercy had just said, I like loud. They entered the Jonathan Edwards common room, warm air closing over them in a gust. Winter light slatted over the leather couches in watery squares, all of it a coy, falsely humble prelude to the soaring rafters and stone alcoves of the dining hall. Beside her, Mercy laughed. I only see you smile like that when we're going to eat. It was true. If Beinecke was Darlington's temple, then the dining hall was where Alex worshipped daily. At the squad in Van Nuys, they'd lived on Taco Bell and Subway when they were flush, cereal, sometimes dry, sometimes soaked in soda if she got desperate when they were broke. She'd steal a bag of hot dog buns whenever they were invited to barbecues at Aton's place so they had something to put peanut butter on, and once she'd tried to eat Loki's dry kibble, but her teeth couldn't manage it. Even when she'd lived with her mom, it had been all frozen food, boil-in-a-bag rice dishes, then weird shakes and nutrition bars after Mira got suckered into selling Herbalife. Alex had brought protein pudding mix to school for weeks. The idea that there could be hot food just waiting for her three times a day was still shocking. But it made no difference what she ate or how much of it, it was as if her body, starved for so long, was ravenous now. Every hour her stomach would growl, chiming like the Harkness bells. Alex always took two sandwiches with her for the day and a stack of chocolate chip cookies wrapped in a napkin. The supply of food in her backpack was like a security blanket. If this all ended, if it all got taken away, she wouldn't go hungry for at least a couple of days. It's a good thing you work out so much, Mercy noted as Alex shoveled granola into her mouth. Except, of course, she didn't and eventually her metabolism would stop cooperating, but she just didn't care. Do you think it's too much to wear a skirt to a mega meltdown tomorrow night? 
You're still committed to this frat thing? Omega Meltdown was part of Mercy's five-party plan to get her and Alex to be more social. Some of us don't have a hot cousin to take us interesting places, so until I'm offered a higher caliber of party, yes. This isn't high school. We don't. Have to be the losers waiting to get invited out. I've wasted too many good outfits on you. Okay, I'll wear a skirt if you wear a skirt, Alex said. Also, I'm going to need to borrow a skirt. No one dressed up for frat parties, but if Mercy wanted to look cute for a bunch of guys in hazmat suits, then that was what they would do. You should wear those boots you have with all the laces. I'm going back for seconds. The basso belladonna kicked in just as she was stacking peanut butter pancakes onto her tray, and she drew in a sharp breath as she came wide awake. It felt a little like someone cracking an ice-cold egg on the nape of your neck. Of course, it was at that moment that Professor Bellbaum waved her over from her table below the leaded windows in the corner of the dining room, her sleek white hair gleaming like a seal's head breaching a wave. Fuck, Alex said under her breath, and then cringed when Bellbaum's mouth quirked as if she'd hurt her. Gimme a minute, she told Mercy, and set down her tray at their table. Marguerite Bellbaum was French, but spoke flawless English. Her hair was snow white and fell in a smooth, severe bob that looked like it had been carved from bone and set carefully on her head like a helmet, so little did it move. She wore asymmetrical black garments that hung in supremely chic folds, and she had a stillness that made Alex twitch. Alex had been in awe of her from the first glimpse of her slender, immaculate form at the Jonathan Edwards orientation, since the first whiff of her peppery perfume. She was a women's studies professor, the head of J.E. College, and one of the youngest people to ever achieve tenure. Alex didn't know exactly what tenure implied, or if young meant thirty or forty or fifty. Bellbaum might have been any of those, depending on the light. Right now, with the basso belladonna in Alex's system, Bellbaum looked a dewy thirty and the light pinging off her white hair glittered like tiny shooting stars. Hi, Alex said, hovering behind one of the wooden chairs. Alexandra, Bellbaum said, resting her chin on her folded hands. She always got Alex's name wrong, and Alex never corrected her. Admitting her name was galaxy to this woman was unthinkable. I know you're breakfasting with your friend, but I need to steal you away. Breakfasting had to be the classiest verb Alex had ever heard. Right up there with. Summering. You have a moment? Her questions never sounded like questions. You'll come to the office, yes? So that we can talk. Of course. Alex said, when what she really wanted to ask was, am I in trouble? When Alex was put on academic probation at the end of her first semester, Bellbaum had given her the news sitting in her elegantly appointed office, three of Alex's papers laid out before her, one on the right stuff, for her sociology class on organizational disasters, one on Elizabeth Bishop's late heir, a poem she'd chosen for its meager length, only to realize she had nothing to say about it and couldn't even use up space with nice long quotes, and one for her class on Swift, which she'd thought would be fun because of Gulliver's Travels. As it turned out, the Gulliver's Travel she'd read had been for children and nothing like the impenetrable original. At the time, Bellbaum had smoothed her hand over the typed pages and gently said that Alex should have disclosed her learning disability. You're dyslexic, yes? Yes, Alex had lied, because she needed some reason for how very far behind everyone else she was. Alex had the sense she should be ashamed of failing to correct Bellbaum, but she'd take all the help she could get. So now what? They were too early in the semester for Alex to have screwed up all over again. Bellbaum winked and gave Alex's hand a squeeze. It's nothing terrible. You needn't look quite so much like you're ready to flee. Her fingers were cool and bony, hard as marble, a single large stone glinted dark gray on her ring finger. Alex knew she was staring, but the drug in her system had made the ring a mountain, an altar, 
a planet in orbit. I prefer singular pieces, Bellbaum said. Simplicity, hm? Alex nodded, tearing her eyes away. She was wearing a pair of three sets for five dollars earrings that she'd boosted from the racks at Claire's in the Fashion Square Mall. Simplicity. Come, Bellbaum said, rising and waving one elegant hand. Let me just get my bag, said Alex. She returned to Mercy and jammed a pancake into her mouth, chewing frantically. Did you see this? Mercy said, turning her phone to Alex. Some New Haven girl got killed last night. In front of Payne Whitney. You must have walked right by the crime scene this morning. Damn, said Alex, casting cursory eyes over the screen of Mercy's phone. I saw the lights. I just thought there was a car accident. So scary. She was only nineteen. Mercy rubbed her arms. What does La Belle Belbaum want? I thought we were going to edit your paper. The world glittered. She felt awake, able to do anything. Mercy was being generous and Alex wanted to work with her before the buzz began to fade, but there was nothing she could do about it. Bellbaum has time now and I need to talk to her about my schedule. I'll meet you back in the room? That bitch can lie like she's breathing, Len had once said of Alex. He'd said a lot of things before he died. Alex trailed the professor out of the dining hall and across the courtyard to her office. She felt shitty leaving Mercy behind. Mercy was from a wealthy suburb of Chicago. Her parents were both professors, and she'd written some kind of crazy paper that had impressed even Darlington. She and Alex had nothing in common. But they'd both been the kid with nobody to sit next to in the cafeteria and Mercy hadn't laughed when Alex had mispronounced Gerda. Around her and Lauren, it was easier to pretend to be the person she was supposed to be here. Still, if La Belle Bellebaum demanded your presence, you didn't argue. Bellebaum had two assistants, who rotated at the desk outside of her office. This morning it was the very peppy, very pretty Colin Catry. He was a member of Scroll and Key, and some kind of chem prodigy. Alex, he exclaimed, like she was a much-anticipated guest at a party. Colin's enthusiasm always seemed genuine, but sometimes its sheer wattage made her want to do something abruptly violent like put a pencil through his palm. Bellbaum just draped her elegant coat on the rack and beckoned Alex into her sanctum. Tea, Colin? Bellbaum inquired. Of course, he said, beaming less like an assistant than an acolyte. Thank you, love. Coat, mouth Colin. Alex shucked off her jacket. She'd once asked Colin what Bellbaum knew about the societies. Nothing, he'd said. She thinks it's all old boy elitist bullshit. She wasn't wrong. Alex had wondered what was so special about the seniors selected by the societies every year. She thought there must be something magical about them. But they were just favorites, legacies, high achievers, charisma queens, the editor of the Daily News, the quarterback for the football team, some kid who had staged a particularly edgy production of Equus that no one wanted to see. People who would go on to run hedge funds and startups and get executive producer credits. Alex followed Bell Baum inside, letting the calm of the office settle over her. The books lining the shelves, the carefully curated objects from Bellbaum's travels, a blown glass decanter that bulged like the body of a jellyfish, some kind of antique mirror, the herbs flowering on the window ledge in white ceramic containers like bits of geometric sculpture. Even the sunlight seemed more gentle here. Alex took a deep breath. Too much perfume? Bellbaum asked with a smile. No. Alex said loudly. It's great. Bellbaum dropped gracefully into the chair behind her desk and gestured for Alex to seat herself on the green velvet couch across from her. Lupa from de Therese, Bellbaum said. Edmund Rudnitska. He was one of the great noses of the twentieth century, and he designed this fragrance for his wife. 
only she was allowed to wear it. Romantic, no? Then. How do I come to wear it? Well, they both died and there was money to be made, so Frederick Mao put it on the market for us peasants to buy. Peasant was a word poor people didn't use. Just like classy was a word that classy people didn't use. But Bellbaum smiled in a way that included Alex, so Alex smiled back in a way she hoped was just as knowing. Colin appeared, balancing a tray laden with a tea set the color of red clay, and placed it on the edge of the desk. Anything else? he asked hopefully. Bellbaum shooed him away. Go do important things. She poured out the tea and offered a cup to Alex. Help yourself to cream and sugar, if you like. Or there's fresh mint. She rose and broke a small sprig from the herbs on the sill. Mint, please, Alex said, taking the sprig and echoing Bellbaum's movements, crushing the leaves, dropping them into her own cup. Bellbaum sat back, took a sip. Alex did the same, then hit a flinch when it burned her tongue. I take it you heard the news about that poor girl? Tara? Bellbaum's slender brows rose. Yes, Tara Hutchins. Did you know her? No, Alex said, annoyed at her own stupidity. I was just reading about. Her. A terrible thing. I will say a more terrible thing and admit that I'm grateful she was not a student. It does not diminish the loss in any way, of course. Of course. But Alex was fairly sure Bellbaum was saying exactly that. Alex, what do you want from Yale? Money. Alex knew Marguerite Bellbaum would find such an answer hopelessly crude. When did you first see them? Darlington had asked. Maybe all rich people asked the wrong questions. For people like Alex, it would never be what do you want. It was always just how much can you get. Enough to survive? Enough to help her take care of her mother when shit fell apart the way it always, always did? Alex said nothing and Bellbaum tried again. Why come here and not to an art school? Lethe had mocked up paintings for her, created a false trail of successes and glowing recommendations to excuse her academic lapses. I'm good, but I'm not good enough to make it. It was true. Magic could create competent painters, proficient musicians, but not genius. She had added art electives to her class schedule because it was expected, and they'd proven the easiest part of her academic life. Because it wasn't her hand that moved the brush. When she remembered to pick up the sketchbook Sando had suggested she buy, it was like letting a trivet skate over a Ouija board, though the images that emerged came from somewhere inside her, Betya half naked and drinking from a hole, hell eye in profile, the wings of a monarch butterfly pushing from her back. I will not accuse you of false humility. I trust you to know your own talents. Bellbaum took another sip of her tea. The world is quite hard on artists who are good but not truly great. So. You wish what? Stability? A steady job? Yes, Alex said, and despite her best intentions the word emerged with a petulant edge. You mistake me, Alexandra. There is no crime in wanting these things. Only people who have never lived without comfort deride it as bourgeois. She winked. The purest Marxists are always men. Calamity comes too easily to women. Our lives can come apart in a single gesture, a rogue wave. And money? Money is the rock we cling to when the current would seize us. Yes, said Alex, leaning forward. This was what Alex's mother had never managed to grasp. Mira loved art and truth and freedom. She didn't want to be a part of the machine. But the machine didn't care. The machine went on grinding and catching her up in its gears. Bellbaum set her cup in its saucer. So once you have money, once you can stop clinging to the rock and can climb atop it, what will you build there? When you stand upon the rock, what will you preach? Alex felt all of the interest go out of her. 
Was she really supposed to have something to say, some wisdom to impart? Stay in school? Don't do drugs? Don't fuck the wrong guys? Don't let the wrong guys fuck with you? Be nice to your parents even if they don't deserve it, because they can afford to take you to the dentist? Dream smaller? Don't let the girl you love die? The silence stretched. Alex gazed at the mint leaves floating in her tea. Well, said Professor Belbaum on a sigh. I ask you these things. Because I don't know how else to motivate you, Alex. Do you wonder why I care? Alex hadn't, actually. She just assumed Belbaum took her job as the head of J.E. seriously, that she looked out for all of the students under her care. But she nodded anyway. We all began somewhere, Alex. So many of these children have had too much handed to them. They've forgotten how to reach. You are hungry, and I respect hunger. She tapped her desk with two fingers. But hungry for what? You're improving, I see that. You've gotten some help, I think, and that's good. You're clearly a smart girl. The academic probation is worrisome, but what worries me more is that the classes you're choosing show no real pattern of interest other than ease. You cannot simply get by here. Can and will, thought Alex. But all she said was, I'm sorry. She meant it. Belbaum was looking for some secret potential to unlock and Alex was going to disappoint her. Belbaum waved away the apology. Think about what you want, Alex. It may not be something you can find here. But if it is, I will do what I can to help you stay. This was what Alex wanted, the perfect piece of this office, the gentle light through the windows, the mint and basil and marjoram growing in lacy clusters. Have you given any thought to your summer plans? asked Belbaum. Would you consider staying here? Coming to work for me? Alex's head snapped up. What could I possibly do for you? Belbaum laughed. Do you think Isabel and Colin are performing complicated tasks? They maintain my calendar, do my filing, organize my life so I don't have to. I have no doubt you could manage it. There's a summer composition program that I think might get your writing where it needs to be to continue here. You could begin to think about what you might consider as a career path. I don't want to see you left behind, Alex. A summer to catch up, to catch my breath. Alex was good at odds. She'd had to be. Before you walked into a deal, you had to know if you would walk out. And she knew the chance that she could bob and weave her way through four years of Yale was unlikely. With Darlington around, it had been different. His help had given her an edge, made this life manageable, possible. But Darlington was gone, who knew for how long, and she was so damn tired of treading water. Belbaum was offering her three months to breathe, to recover, make a plan, gather her resources, to become a real Yale student, not just someone playing the part on Lethe's dime. How would that work? Alex asked. She wanted to set down her cup, but her hand was shaking badly enough she was afraid it would clatter. Show me you can continue to improve. Finish the year strong. And the next time I ask you what you want, I expect an answer. You know about my salon? I had one last night, but I'll have another next week. You can start by attending. I can do that, she said, though she wasn't at all sure she could. I can do that. Thank you. Don't thank me, Alex. Belbaum looked at her over the red rim of her teacup. Just do the work. Alex felt light as she drifted out of the office and waved to Colin. She found herself in the silence of the courtyard. It was like this sometimes, all. Of the doors would close, no one passing through on their way to class or a meal, all the windows shut tight against the cold, and you'd be left in a pocket of silence. Alex let it pool around her, imagined that the buildings surrounding her had been abandoned. What would the campus be like in the summer? Quiet like this? 
humid and unpopulated, a city under glass. Alex had spent her winter break holed up at I.L. Bastone, watching movies on the laptop Lethe had bought for her, afraid Dawes would appear. She'd Skyped with her mom and only ventured out for pizza and noodles. Even the greys had vanished, as if without the students' excitement and anxiety, they had nothing to draw them to campus. Alex thought of the stillness, the late mornings that summer might bring. She could sit behind that desk where Colin and Isabel sat, brew tea, update the JE website, do whatever had to be done. She could pick her courses, ones that had syllabi that didn't change much. She could do the reading ahead of time, take the composition course so she wouldn't have to lean on Mercy so much anymore, assuming Mercy wanted to room with her next year. Next year. Magical words. Bellbaum had built Alex a bridge to a possible future. She just had to cross it. Alex's mother would be disappointed when she didn't go home to California. Or would she? Maybe it was easier this way. When Alex had told her mother she was going to Yale, Mira had looked at her with such sadness that it had taken Alex a long moment to understand her mother thought she was high. Guiltily, Alex snapped a picture of the empty courtyard and texted it to her mom. Cold morning. Meaningless, but evidence that she was okay and here, proof of life. She popped into the bathroom before she headed to class, ran her fingers through her hair. She and Helai had loved wearing makeup, spending their rare bits of spare cash on glitter eyeliner and lip gloss. She missed it sometimes. Here, makeup meant something different, it sent a signal of effort that was unacceptable. Alex endured an hour of Spanish too, dull but manageable because all it required of her was memorization. Everyone was chattering about Tara Hutchins, though no one called her by name. She was the dead girl, the murder victim, the townie who got stabbed. People were talking about crisis lines and emergency therapy for anyone triggered by the event. The TA who led her Spanish class reminded them to use the campus walking service. After dark. I was right near there. I was there like an hour before it happened. I walk by there every day. Alex heard the same things repeated again and again. There was worry, some embarrassment, another bit of proof that, no matter how many chain stores moved in, New Haven would never be Cambridge. But no one seemed truly afraid. Because Tara wasn't one of you, Alex thought, as she packed up her bag. You all still feel safe. Alex had two hours free after class and she meant to spend them hidden away in her dorm room, eating her pilfered sandwiches and writing her report for Sando, then sleeping through the Basso Belladonna crash before she went to her English lecture. Instead, she found her feet carrying her back to Payne Whitney. The intersection was no longer blocked off and the crowds were gone, but police tape still surrounded the triangular swath of barren ground across the street from the gym. The students who passed cast furtive glances at the scene and hurried along, as if mortified to be seen gawking at something so lurid in the cold gray sunlight. A police cruiser was parked half on the sidewalk, and a news van sat across the street. She had to imagine Dean Sando and the rest of the Yale administration were having plenty of harried meetings about damage control this morning. Alex hadn't understood the distinctions between Yale and Princeton and Harvard and the cities they occupied. They were all the same impossible place in the same imaginary town. But it was clear from the way that Lauren and Mercy laughed about New Haven that the city and its university were considered a little less ivy than the others. A murder that close to campus, even if the victim hadn't been a student, couldn't be good PR. Alex wondered if she was looking at the place where Tara had been murdered or if her body had simply been dumped in front of the gym. She should have asked the coroner while he was compelled. But she had to imagine it was the former. If you wanted to get rid of a body, you didn't drop it in the middle of a busy intersection. An image of Helly's shoe, that pink jelly sandal slipping from her painted toes, flashed through Alex's mind. Helly's feet had been wide, the toes crammed together, the skin thick and calloused, 
the only unbeautiful part of her. What am I doing here? Alex didn't want to get any closer to where the body had been. It was the boyfriend. That's what the coroner had told her. He was a dealer. They'd gotten into some kind of argument. The wounds had been extreme, but if he'd been high, who knew what might have been going on in his head? Still, there was something bothering her about the scene. Last night she'd approached from Grove Street, but now she was on the other side of the intersection, directly across from the Baker Hall dorms and the empty, icy ground where Tara had been found. From this angle there was something familiar about the way it all looked, the two streets, the stakes driven into the earth where Tara had died or been abandoned. Was it just seeing it in the daylight without the crowds that made it seem different? A false sense of deja vu? Or maybe the basso belladonna was playing tricks on her as it left her system? The Lethe journals were full of warnings on just how powerful it was. Alex thought of Helly's shoe hanging for a brief moment from her toe, then dropping to the apartment floor with a thunk. Lynn turned to Alex, struggling with the weight of Helly's limp body, his hands cupped beneath her armpits. Betya had Helly's knees tucked against his hip as if they were swing dancing. Come on, Lynn said. Open the door, Alex. Let us out. Let us out. She shook the memory away and glanced at the cluster of greys in front of the gym. There were less of them today, and their mood, if they'd ever really had a mood, had returned to normal. The bridegroom was still there, though. Despite her best attempts to ignore him, the ghost was hard to miss. Crisp trousers, shiny shoes, a handsome face like something out of an old movie, big dark eyes and black hair swept back from his brow in a soft wave the effect spoiled only by the big bloody pockmark of a gunshot wound to his chest. He was an actual haunter, a grey who could pass through the layers of the veil and make his presence felt, rattling windshields and setting off car alarms in the parking garage that stood where his family's carriage factory had once been, and where he'd killed his fiancée and then himself. It was a favorite stop on ghost tours of New England. Alex didn't let her gaze linger, but from the corner of her eye she saw him drift away from the group, sauntering toward her. Time to get gone. She didn't want the interest of greys, particularly greys who could take any kind of real physical form. She turned her back on him and hurried toward the heart of campus. By the time she got back to Vanderbilt, the crash had hold of her. She felt weak, exhausted, as if she'd just emerged from a week of the worst flu of her life. Her report for Sando could wait. She didn't have much to say anyway. She would sleep. Maybe she would dream of summer. She could still smell crushed mint on her fingers. She closed her eyes and saw Helly's face, her pale brows bleached by the sun, vomit clinging to her lip. It was Tara Hutchins's fault. Blondes always made Alex think of Hell Lie. But why had the crime scene looked so familiar? What had she seen in that forlorn patch of dead earth, bracketed by the flow of traffic? Nothing. She'd just had too many late nights, too much Darlington whispering in her ear. Tara was nothing like Hell Lie. She was like a bad knockoff, generic to Helly's name brand. No, said a voice in her head and it was Hell Lie, standing on a skateboard, rocking back and forth on those wide feet, her balance impeccable. Her skin was ashen. Her bikini top was spattered with clumps of her last meal. She's me. She's you without a second chance. Alex fought her way back from the tide of sleep. The room was dark, little light filtering in from the single narrow window. Hell Lie was long gone and so were the people who had hurt her. But someone had hurt Tara Hutchins too. Someone who hadn't been punished. Not yet. Leave it to Detective Turner. That was what the survivor said. Rest easy. Let it go. Focus on your grades. Think of the summer. Alex could see the bridge that Bellbaum had built. She just had to cross it. 
Alex reached into her dresser for the basso belladonna drops. One more afternoon. She could give Tara Hutchins that much before she buried her for good and moved on. The way she'd buried Hell Lie. 6. Last fall. He started her small, with Aurelian. Darlington figured the big magics could wait for later in the semester, and he knew he'd made the right choice when he came downstairs at I.L. Bastone to find Alex perched on the edge of a velvet cushion, gnawing feverishly on a thumbnail. Dawes seemed oblivious, her attention focused on a companion to Linear B, her noise-canceling headphones firmly in place. Ready, he asked. Alex stood and wiped her palms on her jeans. He had her run through the stock of protections in their bags, and Darlington was pleased to see she'd forgotten nothing. Good night, Dawes, he said as they unhooked their coats from the hall rack. We won't be home late. Dawes slid her headphones down to her neck. We have smoked salmon and egg and dill sandwiches. Dare I ask? And Avgolimono. I'd say you're an angel, but you're so much more interesting. Dawes clucked her tongue. It's really not a fall soup. It's barely fall, and there's nothing more fortifying. Besides, after a shot of Hiram's elixir it was tough to get warm. Dawes smiled as she returned to her text. She liked being praised for her cooking almost as much as she liked being acknowledged for her scholarship. The air felt bright and cold against his skin as they walked down Orange, back toward the green campus. Spring came on slow in New England, but fall was like rounding a sharp turn. One moment you were sweating through summer cotton, and the next you shivered beneath a sky gone hard enamel blue. Tell me about Aurelian. Alex blew out a breath. Founded in 1910. Rooms consecrated in Sheffield Sterling Strathcona Hall. Save yourself the mouthful. Everyone calls it SSS. SSS. During the 1932 renovations. Around the same time Bones was sealing off their operating theater, Darlington added. They're what? You'll learn during your first prognostication. But I thought we'd keep the training wheels on for our first journey out. Best that Alex Stern found her footing among the eager, generous Aurelians, rather than in front of the Bonesmen. The university gave those rooms to Aurelian as a gift for services rendered. Which services? You tell me, Stern. Well, they specialize in logomancy, word magic. So something with a contract? The purchase of Sachem's Wood in 1910. It was a huge acquisition of land, and the university wanted to make sure the purchase could never be challenged. That land became Science Hill. What else? People don't take them very seriously. People? Lethe, she amended. The other societies. Because they don't have a real tomb. But we're not like those people, Stern. We aren't snobs. You're most definitely a snob, Darlington. Well, I'm not that particular kind of snob. We have only two real concerns. Does their magic work, and is it dangerous? Does it? asked Alex. Is it? The answer to both questions is sometimes. Aurelian specializes in unbreakable contracts, binding vows, stories that can literally put the reader to sleep. In 1989 a certain millionaire slipped into a coma in the cabin of his yacht. A copy of God and Man at Yale was found beside him, and if anyone had thought to look they would have found an introduction that exists in no other version, one composed by Aurelian. You may also be interested to know that Winston Churchill's last words were, I'm bored with it all. You're saying Aurelian assassinated Winston Churchill? That's mere speculation. But I can confirm that half of the dead in Grove Street Cemetery only stay in their graves because the inscriptions on their tombstones were crafted by members of Aurelian. Sounds pretty powerful to me. That was the old magic, when they were still considered a landed society. Aurelian was kicked out of their rooms when union contract negotiations with the university soured. 
the charge was serving alcohol to minors, but the fact is that Yale felt Aurelian had botched the initial contracts. They lost room 405, and their work has been shaky ever since. These days, they mostly manage the occasional non-disclosure agreement or inspiration spell. That's what we'll be seeing tonight. They passed the administrative offices of Woodbridge Hall and the glowing golden screens of scroll and key. The locksmiths had cancelled their next ritual. It wouldn't mean any less work for Lethe, Book and Snake had been happy to move into the Thursday night slot in their place, but Darlington wondered exactly what was going on at Keys. There had been rumors of weakening magic, portals that malfunctioned or didn't open at all. It might all be talk, the houses of the Vale were secretive, competitive, and prone to petty gossip. But Darlington would take the delay as an opportunity to dig into what Scroll and Key might be contending with before he dragged his Dante into a possible mess. If Aurelian isn't dangerous, why do we need to be there? Alex asked. To keep the proceedings from being interrupted. This particular ritual tends to draw a lot of greys. Why? All of the blood. Alex's steps slowed. Please don't tell me you're squeamish. You won't make it through a semester if you can't handle a bit of gore. Darlington immediately felt like an ass. After what Alex had survived back in California, of course she'd be wary. This girl had witnessed real trauma, not the theater of the macabre to which Darlington had become so accustomed. I'll be fine, she said, but she was gripping the strap of her satchel with clenched fists. They entered the stark plateau of Beinecke Plaza, the library's windows glowing like chunks of amber. You will be, he promised. This is a controlled environment and a simple spell. We're basically just serving as bouncers tonight. Okay. She didn't look okay. They entered the stark plateau of Beinecke Plaza, the library's windows glowing like chunks of amber. You will be, he promised. This is a controlled environment and a simple spell. We're basically just serving as bouncers tonight. Okay. She didn't look okay. They pushed through the library's revolving door and into the high vault of the entry. Gordon Bunshaft had envisioned the library as a box within a box. Behind the empty security desk, a vast glass wall rose to the ceiling, packed with shelves of books. This was the real library, the stacks, the paper and parchment heart of Beinecke, the outer structure that surrounded it acting as entry, shield, and false skin. Large windows on every side showed the empty plaza beyond. A long table had been set up not far from the security desk, a comfortable distance away from the cases, where rotating exhibits from the library's collections were displayed and where the Gutenberg Bible was housed in its own little glass cube, lit from above. A single page of it was turned every day. God, he loved this place. The Aurelians were milling around the table, already in their ivory robes, chatting nervously. That giddy energy alone was probably enough to start drawing greys. Josh Zielinski, the delegation's current president, broke away from the group and hurried over to greet them. Darlington knew him from several American studies seminars. He had a mohawk, favored oversize overalls, and talked a lot. A woman in her forties trailed him, tonight's emperor, the alumna selected to supervise the ritual. Darlington recognized her from a right Aurelian had conducted the previous year to draw up governing documents for her condo board. Amelia, he said, reaching for the name. A pleasure to see you again. She smiled and glanced at Alex. Is this the new you? It was the same thing they'd asked Michelle Alameddin when she'd taken him around his freshman year. Meet our new Dante. Alex is from Los Angeles. Nice, said Zelensky. Do you know any movie stars? I once swam naked in Oliver Stone's pool, does that count? Was he there? No. Zelensky looked genuinely disappointed. We'll start at midnight, said Amelia. 
that gave them plenty of time to set up a perimeter around the ritual table. For this rite, we can't block the greys out completely, Darlington explained as he and Alex walked a wide circle around the table, choosing the path of the boundary they would create. The magic requires that the channels with the veil remain open. Now tell me first steps. He'd assigned her excerpts from Fowler's bindings and also a short treatise on portal magic from the early days of scroll and key. Bone dust or graveyard dirt or any memento mori to form the circle. Good, said Darlington. We'll use this tonight. He handed her a stick. Of chalk made from compressed crematory ash. It will allow us to be more precise in our markings. We'll leave channels open at each compass point. And then what? Then we work the doors. The greys can disrupt the ritual, and we don't want this kind of magic breaking loose. Magic needs resolution. Once this particular rite begins, it will be looking for blood, and if the spell gets free of the table, it could literally slice some nice law student studying a block away in two. One less lawyer to plague the world but I'm told lawyer jokes are passé. So if a gray tries to come through, you have two options, dust them or death words. Greys loathed any reminder of death or dying, lamentations, dirges, poems about grief or loss, even a particularly well-phrased mortuary ad could do the trick. How about both, asked Alex. There's really no need. We don't waste power if we don't have to. She looked skeptical. Her anxiety surprised him. Alex Stern might be graceless and uneducated, but she'd shown plenty of nerve, at least when anything but moths were concerned. Where was the steel he'd glimpsed in her before? And why did her fear disappoint him so acutely? Just as they were finishing their markings to close the circle, a young man passed through the turnstile, his scarf pulled up nearly to his eyes. The guest of honor, murmured Darlington. Who is he? Zeb Yeroman, Wunderkind. Or former Wunderkind. Surely the Germans have a name for prodigies who age out of infant terrible. You would know, Darlington. Too cruel, stern. I have time yet. Zeb Yeroman wrote a novel his junior year at Yale, published it before he graduated and was the darling of the New York literary scene for several years running. Good book? It wasn't bad, Darlington said. Malaise, madness, young love, the usual Bildungsroman fair, all set against the background of Zeb working at his uncle's failing dairy. But the prose did impress. So he's here to mentor someone? He's here because The King of Small Places was published almost eight years ago and Zeb Yeroman hasn't written a word since. Darlington saw Zelinsky signal to the emperor. It's time to start. The Aurelians had assembled in two even lines, facing each other on either side of the long table. They wore white cloaks almost like choir robes, with pointed sleeves so long they brushed the tabletop. Josh Zelinsky stood at one end the emperor at the other. They put on white gloves of the type used to handle archival manuscripts and unfurled a scroll down the table's length. Parchment, said Darlington. Made from goatskin and soaked in elderflower. A gift for the muse. But that's not all she requires. Come on. He led Alex back to the first marks they'd made. You'll watch the southern and eastern gates. Don't stand between the markings unless you absolutely have to. If you see a gray approaching, just step into his path and use your graveyard dirt or speak the death words. I'll be monitoring the north and west. How? Her voice held a nervous, truculent edge. You can't even see them. Darlington reached into his pocket and removed the vial of elixir. He couldn't put it off any longer. He broke the wax covering, unstopped the cork, and, before thoughts of self-preservation could intrude, downed the contents. Darlington had never gotten used to it. He doubted he ever would, the urge to gag, the bitter spike that drove through his soft palate and up into the back of his skull. 
Fuck, he gasped. Alex blinked. I think that's the first time I've heard you swear. Chills shook him, and he tried to control the tremors that quaked through his body. I cc class pp profanity with declarations of love. Best used sparingly, and only when wholeheartedly mm meant. Darlington, are your teeth supposed to chatter? He tried to nod, but of course he was already nodding, spasming, really. The elixir was like dunking your head into the great cold, like stepping into a long, dark winter. Or as Michelle had once said, it's like getting an icicle shoved up your ass. Less localized, Darlington had managed to joke at the time. But he'd wanted to pass out from the shuddering awful of it. It wasn't just the taste or the cold or the tremors. It was the feeling of having brushed up against something horrible. He hadn't been able to identify the sensation then, but months later he'd been driving on I-95 when a tractor trailer swayed into his lane, missing his car by the barest breath. His body had flooded with adrenaline, and the bitter tang of crushed aspirin had filled his mouth as he remembered the taste of Hiram's bullet. That was what it was like every time, and would be until the DOS finally tried to kill him and his liver tipped into toxicity. You couldn't keep sidling up to death and dipping your toe in. Eventually, it grabbed your ankle and tried to pull you under. Well, if it happened, Lethe would find him a liver donor. He wouldn't be the first. And not everyone could be born gifted like Galaxy Stern. Now the shaking passed, and for a brief moment the world went milky, as if he were seeing Beinecke's golden glow through a thick cataract of cobwebs. These were the layers of the veil. When they parted for him, the haze cleared. Beinecke's familiar columns, the cloaked members of Aurelian, and Alex's wary face came into ordinary focus once more, except he saw an old man in a houndstooth jacket hovering by the case that housed the Gutenberg Bible, then strolling past to examine the collection of James Baldwin memorabilia. I think. I think that's, he caught himself before he spoke Frederick Prokosh's name. Names were intimate and risked forming a connection with the dead. He wrote a novel that used to be famous, called The Asiatics, from a desk at Sterling Library. I wonder if Zeb's a fan. Prokosh had claimed to be unknowable, a mystery even to his closest friends. And yet here he was, moping around a college library in the afterlife. Maybe it was best that the elixir cost so much and tasted so bad. Otherwise Darlington would be downing it every other afternoon, just for glimpses like this. But now it was time to work. Send him on his way, Stern. But do not make eye contact. Alex rolled her shoulders like a boxer stepping into the ring and approached Prokosh, keeping her gaze averted. She reached into her bag and pulled out the vial of graveyard dirt. What are you waiting for? I can't get the lid off. Prokosh looked up from the glass case and drifted toward Alex. Then say the words, Stern. Alex took a step backward, still fumbling with the lid. He can't hurt you, said Darlington, putting himself between Prokosh and the entry to the circle. The ritual hadn't yet begun, but best to keep it clean. Darlington didn't love the idea of dispelling the grey himself. He knew too much about the ghost as it was and banishing him back behind the veil risked creating a connection between them. Go on, Stern. Alex squeezed her eyes shut and shouted, Take courage. No one is immortal. Prokosh shuddered in apprehension and lifted a hand, as if to shoo Alex away. He bolted through the library's glass walls. Death words could be anything, really, as long as they spoke of the things Greys feared most, the finality of passing a life without legacy, the emptiness of the hereafter. Darlington had given Alex some of the simplest to recall, from the Orphic lamelli found in Thessaly. See, said Darlington. Easy. He glanced at the Aurelians, a few of whom were giggling at Alex's ardent declaration. Though you needn't shout. But Alex didn't seem to care about the attention she'd drawn. Her eyes were alight 
staring at the place where Prokosh had been moments before. Easy, she said. She frowned and looked at the vial of dirt in her hand. So easy. At least crow a little, Stern. Don't deny me the enjoyment of putting you back in your place. When she didn't reply, he said, Come on, they're ready to start. Zeb Yaroman stood at the head of the table. He had removed his shirt and was naked to the waist, his skin pale, his chest narrow, his arms tight to his sides like folded wings. Darlington had seen many men and women stand at the head of that table over the last three years. Some had been members of Aurelian. Some had simply paid the steep fee the society's trust charged. They came to speak their words, make their requests, hoping for something spectacular to happen. They came with different needs, and Aurelian moved locations depending on their requirement. Ironclad prenups could be fashioned beneath the entryway to the law school. Forgeries might be detected beneath the watchful eyes of poor, duped Benjamin West Cicero, discovering the tomb of Archimedes in the University Art Gallery. Land deeds and real estate deals were sealed high atop East Rock, the city glittering far below. Aurelian's magic may have been weaker than that of the other societies, but it was more portable and more practical. Tonight's chants began in Latin, a soothing, gentle recitation that filled Beinecke, floating up, up, past shelf after shelf encased in the glass cube at the library's center. Darlington let himself listen with one ear as he scanned the perimeter of the circle and kept one eye on Alex. He supposed it was a good sign that she was so tense. It at least meant she cared about doing a good job. The chance shifted, breaking from Latin and shifting into vernacular Italian, sliding from antiquity to modernity. Zeb's voice was the loudest, beseeching, echoing off the stone, and Darlington could feel his desperation. He would have to be desperate given what came next. Zeb held out his arms. The Aurelians to his right and his left drew their knives and, as the chants continued, drew two long lines from Zeb's wrists up his forearms. The blood ran slowly at first, welling to the surface in red slits like eyes opening. Zeb settled his hands on the edge of the paper before him and his blood spread over it, staining the paper. As if the paper had a taste for it, the blood started to flow faster, a tide that crawled down the scroll as Zeb continued to chant in Italian. As Darlington had known they would, the greys began to appear, drifting through the walls, drawn by blood and hope. When at last the blood tide reached the end of the parchment, the Aurelians each lowered their sleeves, letting them brush the soaked paper. Zeb's blood seemed to climb up the fabric as the sound of the chanting rose. Not a single language now but all languages, words drawn from the books surrounding them, above them, tucked away in climate-controlled vaults beneath them. Thousands upon thousands of volumes. Memoirs and children's stories, postcards and menus, poetry and travelogues, soft, rounded Italian speared by the spiky sounds of English, the chugging of German, whispery threads of Cantonese. As one, the Aurelians slammed their hands down on the blood-soaked parchment. The sound ruptured the air like thunder and black spread from their palms, a new tide as blood became ink and flowed back up the table, coursing along the paper to where Zeb's hands rested. He screamed when the ink entered him, zigzagging up his arms in a scrawl, line upon line, word upon word, a palimpsest that blackened his skin, slowly crawling and looping cursive up to his elbows. He wept and shuddered and wailed his anguish, but kept his hands flat to the paper. The ink climbed higher, to his bent shoulders, up his neck, over his chest, and in the same instant entered his head and his heart. This was the most dangerous part of the ritual when all of Aurelian would be most vulnerable and the greys would be most eager. They came faster through the walls and sealed windows, rounding the circle, looking for the gateways Alex and Darlington had left open, drawn by Yaroman's need and the iron-filing pungence of fresh blood. Whatever worry had plagued Alex, she was enjoying herself now, 
hurling handfuls of graveyard dirt at Grays with unnecessarily elaborate gestures that made her look like a professional wrestler trying to psych up an invisible crowd. Darlington turned his attention to his own compass points, cast clouds of bone dust at approaching Grays, murmuring the old death words when one of them tried to rush past. His favorite Orphic hymn began O Spirit of the Unripe Fruit, but it was almost too long to be worth diving into. He heard Alex grunt and glanced over his shoulder, expecting to see her engaged in a particularly acrobatic banishing maneuver. Instead, she was on the ground, scrabbling backward, terror in her eyes, and Greys were walking straight through the circle of protection. It took him a bare moment to understand what had happened, the markings of the southern gateway were smudged. Alex had been so busy enjoying herself, she'd stepped on the markings and ruptured the southern side of the circle. What had been a narrow door to allow the flow of magic had become a gaping hole with no barrier to entry. The greys advanced, their attention focused on the pull of blood and longing, drawing nearer to the unsuspecting Aurelians. Darlington threw himself into their path, barking the quickest, cruelest death words he knew, unwept, he shouted. Unhonored, and unsung. Some checked their steps, some even fled. Unwept, unhonored, and unsung, he repeated. But they had momentum now, a mass of greys that only he and Alex could see, dressed in clothes of every period, some young, some old, some wounded and maimed, others whole. If they reached the table, the ritual would be disrupted. Yeroman would certainly die, and he might well take half of Aurelian with him. The magic would spring wild. But if Beinecke was a living house of words, then it was one grand memorial to the end of everything. Thornton Wilder's Death Mask Ezra Pound's Teeth Elegiac Poems by the Hundreds Darlington reached for the words. Hart Crane on Melville, Ben Johnson on the death of his son. Robert Louis Stevenson's Requiem. His mind scrambled for purchase. Start somewhere. Start anywhere. A wanton bone, I sing my song. And travel where the bone is blown. Good Lord. When taxed with staving off the uncanny, how did he somehow resort to Foley's poem about a skeleton having sex? A few of the greys peeled off, but he needed something with some damn gravitas. Horace. Winter will come on. And break the lower sea on the rocks while we drink summer's wine. Now they slowed, some covered their ears. See, in the white of the winter air, he cried. The day hangs like a rose. It droops down to the reaching hand. Take it before it goes. He lifted his hands before him as if he could somehow push them back. Why couldn't he remember the first verse of the poem? Because it hadn't interested him. Why try to know the future, which cannot be known? Winter will come on, he repeated. But even as Darlington pushed the greys back through the ruptured gate and reached for the chalk, he looked through the glass walls of the library. A horde was assembling, a tide of greys visible through the glass walls, surrounding the building. He was not going to be able to fix the markings in time. Alex was still on the ground, shaking so hard he could see her trembling even from a distance. When the magic got free, it might kill them both first. Take courage, she said again and again. Take courage. That's not enough. The greys rushed toward the library. Moore's Vincent Omnia. Darlington cried, falling back on the words, printed in every lethe manual. The Emperor and the Aurelians had looked up from the table, only Zeb Yeroman was still lost to the agonies of the ritual, deaf to the chaos that had entered the circle. Then a voice pierced the air, high and wobbling, not speaking but singing. Perium mi madre en una noche oscura. Alex was singing, the melody hitching on her sobs. Ponami por nombre nina y sin fortuna. My mother gave birth to me on a dark night and called me the girl with no fortune. Spanish, but slanted. Some kind of dialect. 
y crisen las hierbas y dan amarillo triste mi corazón vi con suspiro. He didn't know the song, but the words seemed to slow the gray steps. The leaves are growing and turning gold. My heavy heart beats and sighs. More, said Darlington. I don't know the rest of the song. Alex yelled. The greys moved forward. Say something, Stern. We need more words. Queen no sabe de mar no sabe de mal. She didn't sing these words, she shouted them, again and again. He who knows nothing of the sea knows nothing of suffering. The line of greys outside stumbled, looked over their shoulders, something was moving behind them. Keep going, he told her. Queen no sabe de mar no sabe de mal. It was a wave, a massive wave, rising from nowhere over the plaza. But how? She wasn't even speaking death words. He who knows nothing of the sea knows nothing of suffering. Darlington wasn't even sure what the words meant. The wave rose and new words came to Darlington from Virgil, the real Virgil. From the eclogues. Let all become mid-ocean, he declared. The wave climbed higher, blotting out the buildings and the sky beyond. Farewell, ye woods. Headlong from some towering mountain peak I will throw myself into the waves, take this as my last dying gift. The wave crashed and greys were scattered over the stone tiles of the plaza. Darlington could see them through the glass, bobbing like chunks of ice in the moonlight. Hastily, Darlington redrew the marks of protection, strengthening them with heaps of graveyard dirt. What was that, he said. Alex was staring out at the fallen greys, her cheeks still wet with tears. I. It was just something my grandmother used to say. Ladino. She'd been speaking Spanish and Hebrew, and he wasn't sure what else. It was the language of diaspora. The language of death. She'd gotten lucky. They both had. He offered her his hand. You're all right? he asked. Her palm was cold, clammy in his, as she rose. Yes, she said, but she was still shaking. Fine. I'm sorry, I. Do not say another word until we're back at I.L. Bastone, and for God's sake, don't apologize to anyone until we're out of here. Zelinsky was striding toward them, the emperor close behind. The ritual had ended and they looked furious, though also a bit like clan members who'd gone for a stroll and forgotten their hoods. What the hell were you doing, said Amelia. You almost ruined the ritual with your shouting. What happened here? Darlington whirled on them, locking their view of the smudged marks and summoning every bit of his grandfather's authority. Why don't you tell me? Zelinsky stopped short, his sleeves, now clean and white again, flapped gently as he dropped his arms. What? Have you performed this ritual before? You know we have, snapped Amelia. Exactly in this way? Of course not. The ritual always changes a bit depending on the need. Every story is different. Darlington knew he was on shaky ground, but better to go on the offense than to make Lethe look like a bunch of amateurs. Well, I don't know what Zeb has in mind for his new novel, but he almost unleashed a whole host of phantoms on your delegation. Zelinsky's eyes widened. There were greys here? An army of them. But she was screaming. You put my Dante and me at risk, said Darlington. I'm going to have to report this to Dean Sando. Aurelian shouldn't be tampering with forces. No, no, please, Zelinsky said, putting his palms up as if to tamp down a fire. Please. This is our first ritual as a delegation. Things were bound to get a little tricky. We're campaigning to get our rooms in SSS back. She could have been hurt, said Darlington, bristling with blue blood indignation. Killed. This is a donation year, isn't it, said Amelia. We, we can make sure it's a generous one. Are you trying to bribe me? No. Not at all. A negotiation, an understanding. 
get out of my sight. You're just lucky no lasting damage was done to the collection. Thanks, Alex whispered as the Emperor and Zelinsky hurried away. Darlington cast her one angry glance and bent to begin the work of clearing the circle. I did that for Lethe, not you. They cleaned up the leavings of the markings, made sure the Aurelians had left no traces and that Zeb's arms were bandaged and his vitals were stable. He still had ink stains on his lips and all over his teeth and gums. It trickled from his ears and the inner corners of his eyes. He looked monstrous, but he was grinning, gibbering to himself, already scribbling away in a notebook. He would continue that way until the story was out of him. Darlington and Alex walked back to Isle Bastone in strained silence. The night felt colder, not only because of the hour, but because of the lasting effects of Hiram's elixir. Usually he felt a sense of sadness when its magic was gone, but tonight he was perfectly happy for the veil to fall back into place. What had happened during the rite? How could Alex have been so incautious? She'd broken the most basic rules he'd set for her. The circle was inviolable. Guard the marks. Had he been too easygoing about the whole thing? Tried too hard to put her at ease? When they entered Isle Bastone, the entry lights flickered, as if the house could sense their mood. Dawes was exactly where they'd left her in front of the fireplace. She glanced up and seemed to shrink more deeply into her sweatshirt, before returning to her array of index cards, happy to turn her back on human conflict. Darlington drew off his coat and hung it by the door, then headed down the hall to the kitchen, not waiting to see if Alex would follow. He turned on the burner to heat Dawes's soup and took the sandwich platter from the refrigerator, setting it down with a loud clatter. A bottle of Syrah had been decanted and he poured himself a glass, then sat and watched Alex, who had slumped into a chair at the kitchen table, her dark eyes trained on the black and white tiles of the floor. He made himself finish his glass of wine, poured another, and at last said, Well? What happened? I don't know, she murmured, her voice barely audible. Not good enough. You are literally of no use to us if you can't handle a few greys. They weren't coming at you. They were. Two of those gates were mine to guard, remember? She rubbed her arms. I just wasn't ready. I'll do better next time. Next time will be different. And the next. And the next. There are six functioning societies and each has different rituals. It wasn't the ritual. Was it the blood? No. One of them grabbed me. You didn't say that was going to happen. I. Darlington couldn't believe what he was hearing. You're saying one of them touched you? More than one. I. That isn't possible. I mean, he set down his wine, ran his hands through his hair. Rarely. So rarely. Sometimes in the presence of blood or if the spirit is particularly moved. That's why true hauntings are so rare. Her voice was hard, distant. It's possible. Maybe. Unless she was lying. You need to be ready next time. You weren't prepared. And whose fault is that? Darlington sat up straighter. I beg your pardon? I gave you two weeks to get up to speed. I sent you specific passages to read to keep it manageable. And what about all of the years before that? Alex stood and shoved her chair back. She paced into the breakfast room, her black hair reflecting the lamplight, energy sparking off her. The house gave a warning groan. She wasn't sad or ashamed or worried. She was mad. Where were you, she demanded. All you wise men of Lethe with your spells and your chalk and your books? Where were you when the dead were following me home? When they were barging into my classrooms? My bedroom? my damn bathtub? Sando said you had been tracking me for years, since I was a kid. One of you couldn't have told me how to get rid of them? 
that all it would take was a few magic words to send them away? They're harmless. It's only the rituals that... Alex grabbed Darlington's glass and threw it hard against the wall, sending glass and red wine flying. They are not harmless. You talk as if you know, like you're some kind of expert. She struck her hands against the table, leaning toward him. You have no idea what they can do. Are you done, or would you like another glass to break? Why didn't you help me, said Alex, her voice nearly a growl. I did. You were about to be buried under a sea of greys, if you recall. Not you. Alex waved her arm, indicating the house. Sando. Lethe. Someone. She covered her face with her hands. Take courage. No one is immortal. Do you know what it would have meant to me to know those words when I was a kid? It would have taken so little to change everything. But no one bothered. Not until I could be useful to you. Darlington did not like to think he had behaved badly. He did not like to think that Lethe had behaved badly. We are the shepherds. And yet they'd left Alex to face the wolves. She was right. They hadn't cared. She'd been someone for Lethe to study and observe from afar. He'd told himself he was giving her a chance, being fair to this girl who had washed up on his shore. But he'd let himself think of her as someone who had made all of the wrong choices and stumbled down the wrong path. It hadn't occurred to him that she was being chased. After a long moment, he said, would it help to break something else? She was breathing hard. Maybe. Darlington rose and opened a cupboard, then another, and another, revealing shelf after shelf of Lennox, Waterford, Limoges glassware, plates, pitchers, platters, butter dishes, gravy boats, thousands of dollars worth of crystal and china. He took down a glass, filled it with wine, and handed it to Alex. Where would you like to start? 7. Winter. There had to be a lethe protocol for murder, a series of steps she should follow, that Darlington would have known to follow. He probably would have told her to enlist Dawes's help. But Alex and the grad student had never managed to do much more than politely ignore each other. Like almost everyone else, Dawes had loved shiny Penny Darlington. He'd been the only person who seemed totally at ease talking to her, who had managed it without any of the awkwardness that hung over Dawes like one of her bulky, indeterminately colored sweatshirts. Alex was pretty sure Dawes blamed her for what had happened at Rosenfeld Hall and though Dawes had never said much to Alex, her silence had taken on a new hostility of slammed cupboards and suspicious glares. Alex didn't want to talk to Dawes any more than she had to. So she would consult the Lethe Library instead. Or you could just leave this whole thing alone, she thought as she climbed the steps to the mansion on Orange. A week from now, Darlington might be back beneath this very roof. He might emerge from the new moon right whole and happy and ready to turn his magnificent brain to the problem of Tara Hutchins's murder. Or maybe he'd have other things on his mind. There was no key to get into I.L. Bastone. Alex had been introduced to the door the first day Darlington brought her to the house, and now it released a creaky sigh as she entered. It had always hummed happily when Darlington was with her. At least it hadn't sicked a pack of jackals on her. Alex hadn't seen the Lethe hounds since that first morning, but she thought about them. Every time she approached the house, wondering where they slept and if they were hungry, if spirit hounds even needed food. In theory, Dawes had Fridays off, but she could almost always be counted on to be burrowed into the corner of the first-floor parlor with her laptop. That made her easy to avoid. Alex slipped down the hall to the kitchen, where she found the plate of last night's sandwiches Dawes had left covered with a damp towel on the top shelf of the fridge. She shoveled them into her mouth, feeling like a thief, but that just made the soft white bread, the cucumber coins, and thinly sliced salmon spiked with dill taste better. The house on Orange had been acquired by Lethe in 1888, shortly after John Anderson abandoned it 
supposedly trying to outrun the ghost of the cigar girl his father had murdered. Since then, Illinois Bastogne had masqueraded as a private home, a school run by the Sisters of St. Mary's, a law office, and now as a private home perpetually awaiting renovation. But it had always been Lethe. A bookcase stood in the second-floor hallway beside an antique secretary and a vase of dried hydrangea. This was the entry to the library. There was an old panel in the wall beside it that supposedly controlled a stereo system, but it only worked about half the time and sometimes the music coming through the speakers sounded so tinny and far away, it made the house feel more empty. Alex drew the Albemarle book from the third shelf. It looked like an ordinary ledger bound in stained cloth, but its pages crackled slightly as she opened it, and she swore when a low thrum of electricity jolted through her. The book retained echoes of a user's most recent request, and as Alex flipped to the last page of entries, she saw Darlington's scrawl and the words Rosenfeld Hall schematics. The date was December 10th. The last night Daniel Arlington had been seen alive. Alex took a pen from the top of the secretary, wrote out the date and then Lethe House Protocols. Homicide She slid the book back onto the shelf between Stover at Yale and a battered copy of New England Cookery, Volume 2. She'd never seen any sign of Volume 1. The house gave a disapproving groan and the shelf shook slightly. Alex wondered if Dawes was too deep in her work to notice or if she would be turning her eyes to the ceiling, speculating on what Alex might be up to. When the bookcase stopped rattling, Alex gripped its right side and pulled. It swung out from the wall like a door, revealing a two-story circular chamber lined with bookshelves. Though it was still afternoon, the sky through the glass dome above her glowed the luminous blue of early dusk. The air felt slightly balmy, and she could smell orange blossoms on the air. Lethe had a limited amount of room, so the library had been rigged with a telescope portal, using magic borrowed from scroll and key, and deployed by the late Lethe delegate Richard Albemarle when he was still only a Dante. You wrote down the subject you sought in the Albemarle book, placed it in the bookcase, and the library would kindly retrieve a selection of volumes from the Lethe House collection which would be waiting for you when you swung open the secret door. The full collection was located in an underground bunker beneath an estate in Greenwich and was heavily weighted toward the history of the occult, New Haven, and New England. It had an original printing of Heinrich Kramer's Malleus Malficarum and 52 different translations of its text, the complete works of Paracelsus, the secret diaries of Aleister Crowley and Francis Bacon, a spellbook from the Zoroastrian Fire Temple in Chuck Chuck, a signed photo of Calvin Hill, and a first edition of William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale, along with a spell written on a Yankee doodle napkin that revealed the book's secret chapters. But good luck finding a copy of Pride and Prejudice or a basic history of the Cold War that didn't focus entirely on the faulty magic used in the wording of the Eisenhower Doctrine. The library was also a little temperamental. If you weren't specific enough in your request, or if it couldn't find books on your desired subject, the shelf would just keep shaking and eventually start to give off heat and emit a high, frantic whine, until you snatched the Albemarle book and murmured a soothing incantation over its pages while gently caressing its spine. The portal magic also had to be maintained through a series of elaborate rites conducted every six years. What happens if you guys miss a year? Alex had asked when Darlington first showed her how the library worked. It happened in 1928. And? All of the books from the collection crowded into the library at once and the floor collapsed on Chester Vance, Oculus. Jesus, that's horrible. I don't know, Darlington had said meditatively. Suffocating beneath a pile of books seems an appropriate way to go for a research assistant. Alex always approached the library with caution and didn't get near the bookcase when it was shaking. It was too easy to imagine some future Darlington joking about the delicious irony of ignorant Galaxy Stern being fatally clocked in the jaw by rogue knowledge. She set her bag down on the circular table at the room's center, 
the wood inlaid with a map of constellations she didn't recognize. It was strange to Alex that the smell of books was always the same. The ancient documents in the climate-controlled stacks and glass cases of Beinecke. The research rooms at Sterling. The changeable library of Lethe House. They all had the same scent as the fluorescent-lit reading rooms full of cheap paperbacks she'd lived in as a kid. Most of the shelves were empty. There were some heavy old books on New Haven history and a glossy paperback titled New Haven Mayhem. That had probably been sold in tourist shops. It took Alex a minute to realize that one shelf was packed with reprints of the same slender volume, The Life of Lethe, Procedures and Protocols of the Ninth House, initially hardbound and then stapled together more cheaply when Lethe lost some of its pretensions and began watching its budget. Alex reached for the most recent edition, the year 1987 stamped on its cover. It had no table of contents, just pages reproduced crookedly on a copier with the occasional note in the margin, and a ticket stub for Squeeze playing the New Haven Coliseum. The Coliseum was long gone, demolished for apartments and a community college campus that had failed to materialize. Alex had seen a teen gray in an REM t-shirt roaming around the parking lot that had taken the Coliseum's place, moving in aimless circles as if still hoping to score tickets. The entry for murder was frustratingly short. In the event of violent death associated with the activities of the landed societies, a colloquy will be called between the dean, the university president, the active members of Lethe House, the acting centurion, and the president of the Lethe Trust to decide a course of action. See Meeting Protocols Alex flipped to Meeting Protocols, but all she found was a diagram of the Lethe House dining room, along with a guide to seating according to precedence, a reminder of the need for minutes to be kept by the residing oculus, and suggested menus. Apparently, light fare was prescribed, alcohol to be served only upon request. There was even a recipe for something called minted slush punch. Big help, Fellas, Alex muttered. They talked about death like it was a breach of manners. And she had no idea how to pronounce colloquy, but it was obviously a big-ass meeting she had no intention of calling. Was she really supposed to hit up the president of the university and invite him over for cold meats? Sando had told her to rest easy. He hadn't said anything about a colloquy. Why? Because this is a funding year. Because Tara Hutchins is town. Because there's no indication the societies are involved at all. So let it go. Instead, Alex returned to the hallway, shut the door to the library, and reopened the Albemarle book. This time the scent of cigars puffed up from the pages and she heard the clinking of dishes. That was the lethe memory of murder, not blood or suffering, but men gathered around a table, drinking minted slush punch. She hesitated, trying to think of the right words to guide the library, then she inscribed a new entry, How to Speak to the Dead. She slid the book into place and the bookcase shuddered violently. This time when she entered the library, the shelves were packed. It was hard not to feel that Darlington was somehow looking over her shoulder the eager scholar restraining himself from interfering in her clumsy attempts at research. When did you first see them? Alex had told Darlington the truth. She simply couldn't remember the first time she'd seen the dead. She'd never even called them that in her head. The blue-lipped girl in a bikini by the pool, the naked man standing behind the chain-link fence at the schoolyard, toying lazily with himself as her class ran suicides the two boys in bloody sweatshirts seated at a booth at the in and out who never ordered. They were just the quiet ones, and if she didn't pay them too much attention, they left her alone. That had all changed in a Galita bathroom when she was twelve years old. By then she'd learned to keep her mouth shut about the things she saw, and she'd been doing pretty well. When it was time to start junior high, she asked her mother to start calling her Alex instead of Galaxy and to fill out her school forms that way. At her old school, everyone had known her as the twitchy kid who talked to herself and flinched at things that weren't there, 
who didn't have a dad and who didn't look like her mom. One counselor thought she had ADD, another thought she needed a more regular sleep schedule. Then there was the vice principal, who had taken her mother aside and murmured that Alex might just be a little slow. Some things can't be fixed with therapy or a pill, you know? Some kids are below average, and there's room for them in the classroom too. But a new school meant a fresh start, a chance to remake herself into someone ordinary. You shouldn't be ashamed to be different, her mother had said when Alex had summoned the courage to ask for the name change. I called you Galaxy for a reason. Alex didn't disagree. Most of the books she read and the TV shows she watched told her different was okay. Different was great. Except no one was different quite like her. Besides, she thought, as she looked around their tiny apartment laden with dream catchers and silk scarves and paintings of fairies dancing under the moon, it wasn't like she was ever really going to be like everyone else. Maybe I can work up to it. All right, Mira said. That is your choice, and I respect it. Then she'd yanked her daughter into her arms and blown a raspberry on her forehead. But you're still my little star. Alex had squirmed away, laughing, nearly woozy with relief and anticipation, then started thinking about how she could get her mom to buy her new jeans. Seventh grade started and Alex wondered if her new name was some kind of magic word. It didn't fix everything. She still didn't have the right sneakers or the right scrunchie or bring the right things for lunch. It couldn't make her blonde or tall or prune her thick eyebrows, which had to be vigilantly kept from joining forces to create a unified eyebrow front. The white kids still thought she was Mexican and the Mexican kids still thought she was white. But she was doing okay in class. She had people to eat with at lunchtime. She had a friend named Megan, who invited her over to watch movies and eat bowls of sugary name-brand cereals shimmering with artificial colors. On the morning of the Galita trip, when Ms. Rosales told them to buddy up and Megan seized Alex's hand, Alex felt a gratitude so overwhelming, she thought she might vomit the tiny blueberry muffins the teachers had provided. They spent the morning drinking hot chocolate from foam cups, pressed together on the green vinyl seat of the bus. Both of their moms liked Fleetwood Mac, and when Go Your Own Way came on the bus driver's radio, they sang along with it, mostly shouting, giggling and breathless as Cody Morgan pressed his hands to his ears and yelled at them to shut up. It took nearly three hours to get to the Butterfly Reserve, and Alex savored every minute of the drive. The grove itself was nothing special, a pretty sprawl of eucalyptus trees lined by dusty paths, and a guide who talked about the eating habits and migration patterns of monarchs. Alex glimpsed a slender woman walking through the grove, her arm hanging from her body by the barest scrap of tendon, and quickly looked away, just in time to see a blanket of orange wings gust up from the trees as the monarchs took flight. She and Megan ate their lunches shoulder to shoulder on picnic tables near the entrance, and before they got back on the buses, everyone went to use the bathrooms. They were low slab buildings with damp concrete floors, and both Megan and Alex gagged when they entered. Forget it, said Megan. I can hold it until we get back. But Alex had to go. She chose the cleanest metal stall, laid toilet paper carefully on the seat, pulled down her jean shorts, and froze. For a long moment, she wasn't sure what she was looking at. The blood was nearly dry and so brown that she had trouble understanding it was blood. She'd gotten her period. Wasn't she supposed to have cramps or something? Megan had gotten hers over the summer and had lots of thoughts about tampons and pads and the importance of ibuprofen. The only important thing was that the blood hadn't soaked through to her shorts. But how was she supposed to make it through the bus ride home? Megan, she shouted. But if anyone else was in the bathroom, they'd already cleared out. Alex felt her panic rise. She needed to get to Ms. Rosales before everyone was seated and ready to go. She would know what to do. Alex wound a bunch of toilet paper around her hand and tucked the makeshift pad into her ruined underwear, 
then pulled up her shorts and shoved out of the stall. She yelped. A man was standing there, his face a mottled mess of bruises. She was relieved when she realized he was dead. A dead man in the girl's bathroom was a lot less scary than a living one. She balled her fists and pushed through him. She hated going through them. Sometimes she got flashes of memory, but this time she just felt a blast of cold. She hurried to the sinks and quickly washed her hands. Alex could sense he was still there, but she refused to meet his gaze in the mirror. She felt something brush the small of her back. In the next second, her face was jammed up against the mirror. Something shoved her hips against the porcelain ledge of the sink. She felt cold fingers tugging on the waistband of her shorts. Alex screamed, she kicked out, struck solid flesh and bone, felt the grip on her shorts loosen. She tried to shove back from the sink, glimpsed her face in the mirror, a blue barrette sliding from her hair, saw the man, the thing, that had hold of her. You can't do that, she thought. You can't touch me. It wasn't possible. It wasn't allowed. None of the quiet ones could touch her. Then she was face down on the concrete floor. She felt her hips jerked backward, her panties yanked down, something nudging against her, pushing into her. She saw a butterfly lying in a puddle beneath the sink, one wing flapping listlessly as if it were waving to her. She screamed and screamed. That was how Megan and Ms. Rosales found her, on the bathroom floor, shorts crumpled around her ankles, panties at her knees, blood smeared over her thighs and a lump of blood-soaked toilet paper wadded between her legs, as she sobbed and thrashed, hips humped up and shuddering. Alone. Ms. Rosales was beside her, saying, Alex. Sweetheart, and the thing that had been trying to get inside her was gone. She never knew why he stopped, why he fled, but she'd clung to Ms. Rosales, warm and alive and smelling of lavender soap. Ms. Rosales sent Megan out of the bathroom. She dried Alex's tears and helped her clean up. She had a tampon in her purse and told Alex how to put it in. Alex followed her instructions, still shaking and crying. She didn't want to touch down there. She didn't want to think about him trying to push in. Ms. Rosales sat beside her on the bus, gave her a juice box. Alex listened to the sounds of the other kids laughing and singing, but she was afraid to turn around. She was afraid to look at Megan. On that long bus ride back to school, in the long wait at the nurse's office, all she had wanted was her mother, to be wrapped up in her arms and taken home, to be safe in their apartment bundled in blankets on the couch, watching cartoons. By the time her mother arrived and finished her whispered conversation with the principal and the school counselor and Ms. Rosales, the halls had cleared and the school was empty. As Mira led her out to the parking lot through the echoing quiet, Alex wished she were still small enough to be carried. When they got home, Alex showered as quickly as possible. She felt too vulnerable, too naked. What if he came back? What if something else came for her? What was to stop him, to stop any of them, from finding her? She'd seen them walk through walls. Where could she ever be safe again? She left the shower running and slipped into the kitchen to burrow through their junk drawer. She could hear her mother murmuring on the phone in her bedroom. They think she may have been molested, Mira said. She was crying that she's acting out now because of it. I don't know. I don't know. There was that swim coach at the Y. He always seemed a little off and Alex didn't like going to the pool. Maybe something happened? Alex had hated the pool because there was a quiet kid with the left side of his skull caved and who liked to hang around the rusted podium where the diving board had once been. She rooted around in the drawer until she found the little red pocket knife. She took it with her into the shower, setting it on the soap dish. She didn't know if it would do any good against one of the quiet ones, but it made her feel a little better. She washed quickly, dried off, and changed into pajamas, 
then went out into the living room to curl up on the couch, her wet hair wrapped in a towel. Her mother must have heard the shower turn off, because she emerged from her bedroom a few moments later. Hey, baby, she said softly. Her eyes were red. Are you hungry? Alex kept her eyes on the TV screen. Can we have real pizza? I can make you pizza here. Don't you want almond cheese? Alex said nothing. A few minutes later, she heard her mother on the phone, ordering from Amici's. They ate watching TV, Mira pretending not to watch Alex. Alex ate until her stomach hurt, then ate some more. It was too late for cartoons, and the shows had switched to the bright sitcom stories of teenage wizards and twins living in lofts that everyone at school pretended they were too old for. Who are these people? Alex wondered. Who are these happy, frantic, funny people? How are they so unafraid? Her mother nibbled on a piece of crust. Then at last she reached for the remote and hit mute. Baby, she said. Galaxy. Alex. Alex, can you talk to me? Can we talk about what happened? Alex felt a hard burble of laughter pushing at her throat, making it ache. If it got free, would she laugh or cry? Can we talk about what happened? What was she supposed to say? A ghost tried to rape me? Maybe he did rape me? She wasn't sure when it counted, how far inside he had to be. But it didn't matter, because no one would believe her anyway. Alex clutched the pocket knife in her pajama pocket. Her heart was suddenly racing. What could she say? Help me. Protect me. Except no one could. No one could see the things hurting her. They might not even be real. That was the worst of it. What if she'd imagined it all? She might just be crazy, and then what? She wanted to start screaming and never stop. Baby? Her mother's eyes were filling with tears again. Whatever happened, it's not your fault. You know that, right? You. I can't go back to school. Galaxy. Mama, Alex said, turning to her mother, grabbing her wrist, needing her to listen. Mama, don't make me go. Mira tried to draw Alex into her arms. Oh, my little star. Alex did scream then. She kicked at her mom to keep her away. You're a fucking loser, she shrieked again and again, until her mother was the one crying and Alex locked herself in her room, sick with shame. Mira let Alex stay home for the rest of the week. She'd found a therapist to take Alex in for a session, but Alex had nothing to say. Mira pleaded with Alex, tried to bribe her with junk food and TV hours, then at last said, you talk to the therapist or you go back to school. So the following Monday, Alex had gone back to school. No one spoke to her. They barely looked at her and when she found spaghetti sauce smeared on her gym locker, she knew that Megan had told. Alex got the nickname Bloody Mary. She ate lunch by herself. She was never picked for lab partner or field trip buddy and had to be foisted on people. In desperation, Alex made the mistake of trying to tell Megan what had really happened, of trying to explain. She knew it was stupid, even as she'd reeled off the things she'd seen the things she knew, as she'd watched Megan shift farther away from her, her eyes going distant, twirling a long curl of glossy brown hair around her forefinger. But the more Megan drew away, the longer her silence stretched, the more Alex talked, as if somewhere in all of those words was a secret code, a key that would get back the glimmer of what she'd lost. In the end, all Megan said was, Okay, I have to go now. Then she'd done what Alex knew she would and repeated it all. So when Sarah McKinney begged Alex to meet her at Trace Machachos to talk to the ghost of her grandmother, Alex had known it was probably a setup, one big joke. But she went anyway, still hoping, and found herself sitting in the food court, trying not to cry. 
That's when Mosh had looked over from the counter at Hot Dog on a stick and taken pity on her. Mosh was a senior with dyed black hair and a thousand silver rings on her corpse white hands. She knew all about mean girls, and she invited Alex to hang out with her friends in the parking lot of the mall. Alex hadn't been sure how to act, so she stood with her hands in her pockets until Mosh's boyfriend offered her the bong they were passing around. She's twelve years old. Mosh had said. She's stressed, I can see it. And she's cool, right? Alex had seen older kids at her school take drags on joints and cigarettes. She and Megan had pretended to smoke, so she at least knew you weren't supposed to blow it out like a cigarette. She clamped her lips on the bang and drew in the smoke, tried to hold it, coughed loud and hard. Mosh and her friends broke into applause. See, said Mosh's boyfriend. This kid is cool. Pretty too. Don't be a creep, said Mosh. She's just a kid. I didn't say I wanted to fuck her. What's your name anyway? Alex. Mosh's boyfriend held his hand out. He had leather bracelets on both wrists, a smattering of dark hair on his forearms. He didn't look like the boys in her grade. She shook his hand and he gave her a wink. Nice to meet you, Alex. I'm Len. Hours later, crawling into bed, feeling both sleepy and invincible, she realized she hadn't seen a single dead anything since the smoke first hit her lungs. Alex learned it was a balance. Alcohol worked, oxy, anything that unwound her focus. Valium was the best. It made everything soft and wrapped her in cotton. Speed was a huge mistake, Adderall especially, but Molly was the worst of all. The one time Alex made that mistake, she not only saw greys, she could feel them, their sadness and their hunger oozing toward her from every direction. Nothing like the incident in the Grove bathroom had happened again. None of the quiet ones had been able to touch her, but she didn't know why. And they were still everywhere. The beautiful thing was that around her new friends, her high friends, she could freak out and they didn't care. They thought it was hilarious. She was the youngest kid who got to hang with them, their mascot, and they all laughed when she talked to things that weren't there. Mosh called girls like Megan the blonde bitches and mutant cuties. She said they were all sad little fishes drinking their own piss in the mainstream. She said she'd kill for Alex's black hair, and when Alex said the world was full of ghosts trying to get in, Mosh just shook her head and said, you should write this stuff down, Alex. I swear. Alex got held back a year. She got suspended. She took cash from her mom's purse, then little things from around the house, then finally, her grandfather's silver kiddish cup. Mira cried and shouted, and set new house rules. Alex broke them all, felt guilty for making her mom sad, felt furious at feeling guilty. It all made her tired, so eventually she stopped coming home. When Alex turned 15, her mother used the last of her savings to try to send her to a scared straight rehab for troubled teens. By then Mosh was long gone, off at art school, and she didn't hang with Alex or Len or any of the other kids when she came home for the holidays. Alex had run into her at the beauty supply, still buying black hair dye. Mosh asked how school was, and when Alex just laughed, Mosh had started to offer her an apology. What are you talking about? Alex said. You saved me. Mosh had looked so sad and ashamed that Alex practically ran out of the store. She'd gone home that night, wanting to see her mom and sleep in her own bed. But she woke up to a pair of beefy men shining a flashlight in her eyes and dragging her out of her room as her mom looked on and cried, saying, I'm sorry, baby. I don't know what else to do. Apparently, it was a big day for apologies. They bound her wrists with zip ties, tossed her in the back of an SUV, barefoot in pajamas. They screamed at her about respect and breaking her mother's heart and that she was going to Idaho to learn the right way to live and she had a lesson coming. 
But Lin had shown Alex how to snap zip ties and it only took her two tries to get herself free, quietly open the back door, and vanished between two apartment buildings before the meatheads in the front seat realized she was gone. She walked seven miles to where Len was working at Baskin Robbins. After his shift, they put Alex's blistered feet in a tub of bubblegum ice cream and got high and had sex on the storeroom floor. She worked at a TGI Fridays, then a Mexican restaurant that scraped the beans off the customers' plates and reused them every night, then a laser tag place, and a mailboxes, etc. One afternoon, when she was standing at the shipping desk, a pretty girl with chestnut curls came in with her mother and a stack of manila envelopes. It took Alex a solid minute to realize it was Megan. Standing there in her maroon apron, watching Megan chat with the other clerk, Alex had the sudden sensation that she was among the quiet. Ones, that she had died in that bathroom all of those years ago, and that people had been looking straight through her ever since. She'd just been too high to notice. Then Megan glanced over her shoulder and the skittery, tense look in her eye had been enough for Alex to come back to her body. You see me, she thought. You wish you didn't, but you do. The years slid by. Sometimes Alex would put her head up, think about staying sober, think about a book or school or her mom. She'd fall into a fantasy of clean sheets and someone to tuck her in at night. Then she'd catch a glimpse of a biker, the skin scraped from the side of his face, the pulp beneath studded with gravel, or an old woman with her housecoat half open, standing unnoticed in front of the window of an electronics store, and she'd go back under. If she couldn't see them, somehow they couldn't see her. She'd gone on that way until Hell Lie, Golden Hell Lie, the girl Len had expected her to hate, maybe hoped she would, the girl she'd loved instead. Until that night at Ground Zero, when everything had gone so very wrong, until the morning she'd woken up to Dean Sando in her hospital room. He'd taken some papers out of his briefcase, an old essay she'd written when she still bothered going to school. She didn't remember writing it, but the title read, A Day in My Life. A big red F was scrawled over the top, beside the words the assignment was not fiction. Sando had perched on a chair by the side of her bed and asked, The things you describe in this essay, do you still see them? The night of the Aurelian ritual, when the greys had flowed into the protective circle, taken on form, drawn by blood and longing, it had all come flooding back to her. She'd almost lost everything before she'd begun, but somehow she'd held on, and with a little help, like a summer job learning to brew the perfect cup of tea in Professor Bellbaum's office, for starters, she thought she could hold on a little longer. She just had to lay Tara Hutchins to rest. By the time Alex finished in the Lethe Library, the sun had set and her brain felt numb. She'd made the initial mistake of not limiting the retrieved books to English, and even after she'd reset the library, there were a baffling number of hard-to-parse texts on the shelf, academic papers and treatises that were simply too dense for her to pull apart. In a way, it made things easier. There were only so many rituals Alex could understand, and that narrowed her options. Then there were the rites that required a particular alignment of the planets or an equinox or a bright day in October, one that demanded the foreskin of a young, hand man of full courage, and another that called for the less disturbing but equally hard to procure feathers of one hundred golden ospreys. The satisfaction of a job well done was one of those phrases Alex's mom liked. Hard work tires the soul. Good works feed the soul. Alex wasn't sure that what she intended qualified as good work at all, but it was better than doing nothing. She copied the text, since her phone wouldn't work in the annex, even to take a photo, then sealed up the library and trudged down the stairs to the parlor. Hey, Dawes. Alex said awkwardly. No response. Pamela. She was in her usual spot, huddled on the floor by the grand piano, a highlighter shoved between her teeth. Her laptop was set off to one side, and she was surrounded by stacks of books and rows of index cards with what Alex thought might be chapter titles for her dissertation. 
Hey, she tried again, I need you to go with me on an errand. Dawes shuffled from Eleusis to Empoli under Mimesis and the chariot's wheel. I have work to do, she mumbled around the highlighter. I need you to go with me to the morgue. Now Dawes glanced up, brow furrowed, blinking like someone newly exposed to sunlight. She always looked a little put out when you spoke to her, as if she'd been on the brink of the revelation that would finally help her finish the dissertation she'd been writing for six years. She removed the highlighter from her mouth, wiping it unceremoniously on her nubbly sweatshirt, which might have been gray or navy, depending on the light. Her red hair was twisted into a bun, and Alex could see the pink halo of a zit forming on her chin. Why? he asked Dawes. Tara Hutchins. Does Dean Sando want you to go? I need more information, Alex said. For my report. That was a problem dear Dawes should be able to sympathize with. Then you should call Centurion. Turner isn't going to talk to me. Dawes ran a finger over the edge of one of her index cards. Heretical hermeneutics, Josephus, and the influence of the trickster on the fool. Her nails were bitten down to the quick. Aren't they charging her boyfriend? asked Dawes, pulling at her fuzzy sleeve. What does this have to do with us? Probably nothing. But it was a Thursday night, and I think we should make sure. It's what we're here for, right? Alex hadn't actually said, Darlington would do it, but she might as well have. Dawes shifted uncomfortably. But if Detective Turner, Turner can go fuck himself, Alex said. She was tired. She'd missed dinner. She'd wasted hours on Tara Hutchins and she was about to waste a few more. Dawes worried her lip as if she was legitimately trying to visualize the mechanics. I don't know. Do you have a car? No. Darlington does. Did a fuck. For a moment, he was there in the room with them, gilded and capable. Dawes rose and unzipped her backpack, removed a set of keys. She stood in the fading light, weighing them in her palm. I don't know, she said again. She might have been referring to a hundred different things. I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't know if you can be trusted. I don't know how to finish my dissertation. I don't know if you robbed me of our golden, destined for glory, perfect boy. How are we going to get in? Dawes asked. I'll get us in. And then what? Alex handed her the sheet of notes she'd transcribed in the library. We have all this stuff, right? Dawes scanned the page. Her surprise was obvious when she said, This isn't bad. Don't apologize. Just do the work. Dawes nod on her lower lip. Her mouth was as colorless as the rest of her. Maybe her thesis was draining the life right out of her. Couldn't we call a car instead? We may need to leave in a hurry. Dawes sighed and reached for her parka. I'm driving. 8. Winter. Dawes had parked Darlington's car a little ways up the block. It was an old wine-colored Mercedes, maybe from the 80s, Alex had never asked. The seats were upholstered in caramel leather, worn in some places, the stitching a bit threadbare. Darlington had always kept the car clean, but now it was immaculate. Dawes's hand no doubt. As if asking for permission, Dawes paused before she turned the key in the ignition. Then the car rumbled to life and they were moving away from campus and out onto the highway. They rode in silence. The office of the chief medical examiner was actually in Farmington, almost forty miles outside New Haven. The morgue, thought Alex. I'm going to the morgue. In a Mercedes. Alex thought about turning on the radio, the old kind with a red line that glided through the stations like a finger seeking the right spot on a page. Then she thought of Darlington's voice floating out of the speakers, get out of my car, stern, and decided she was fine with the silence. It took them the better part of the hour to find their way to the OCME.
Alex wasn't sure what she'd expected, but when they got there she was grateful for the bright lights, the big lot, the office park feel of it all. Now what, said Dawes. Alex took the plastic baggie and the tin they'd prepared from her satchel and wedged them into the back pockets of her jeans. She opened her door, shrugged off her coat and scarf, and tossed them onto the passenger seat. What are you doing? asked Dawes. I don't want to look like a student. Give me your sweatshirt. Alex's peacoat was thin wool with a polyester lining, but it screamed college. That was exactly why she'd bought it. Dawes seemed like she wanted to object, but she unzipped her parka, shucked off her sweatshirt, and tossed it over to Alex, shivering in her t-shirt. I'm not sure this is a good idea. Of course it isn't. Let's go. Through the glass doors, Alex saw that the waiting room had a few people in it, all trying to get their business done before closing. A woman sat at a desk near the back of the room. She had fluffy brown hair that showed a red rinse beneath the office lights. Alex sent a quick text to Turner, we need to talk. Then she told Dawes, wait five minutes and then come in, sit down, pretend you're waiting for someone. If that woman leaves her desk, text me right away, okay? What are you going to do? Talk to her. Alex wished she hadn't wasted her coin of compulsion on the coroner. She had only one left and she couldn't afford to use it to get past the front desk, not if the plan went the way she hoped. She tucked her hair behind her ears and bustled into the waiting room, rubbing her arms. A poster had been hung behind the desk, sympathy and respect. A small sign read, My name is Moira Adams and I'm glad to help. Glad, not happy. You weren't supposed to be happy in a building full of dead people. Moira looked up and smiled. She had some hard living lines around her. Eyes and a cross around her neck. Hi, Alex said. She made a show of taking a deep, shuddering breath. Um, a detective said I could come here to see my cousin. Okay, Hond, of course. What's your cousin's name? Tara and Hutchins. The middle name had been easy enough to come by online. The woman's face grew wary. Tara Hutchins had been in the news. She was a homicide victim, the kind that could draw crazies. Detective Turner sent me here. Moira's expression was still cautious. He was the lead detective on the case and his name had most likely been in the media. You can have a seat while I try to reach him, said Moira. Alex held up her phone. He gave me his information. She sent another quick text, pick up now, Turner. Then she slid to the call screen and dialed on speaker. Here, she said, holding out her cell. Moira sputtered, I can't, but the faint sound of the phone ringing and Alex's expectant expression did the trick. Moira pressed her lips together and took the cell from Alex. The call went to Turner's voicemail, just as Alex had known it would. Detective Abel Turner would pick up when he damn well felt like it, not when some pissy undergrad told him to, especially not when she demanded it. Alex hoped Moira would just hang up, but instead she cleared her throat and said, Detective Turner, this is Moira Adams, public outreach at OCME. If you could give us a call back, she gave the number. All Alex could hope was that Turner wouldn't check a voicemail from her number any time too soon. Maybe he'd be really petty and delete it. Tara was a good girl, you know, she said when Moira handed her phone back. She didn't deserve any of this. Moira made sympathetic sounds. I'm so sorry for your loss. Like she was reading from a script. I just need to pray over her, say my goodbyes. Moira's fingers touched her cross. Of course. She had a lot of problems but who doesn't? We got her going to church every weekend. You can bet that boyfriend of hers didn't like it. At this Moira gave a little huff of agreement. You think Detective Turner will call back soon? As soon as he can. He may be tied up. But you guys close in an hour, 
right? To the public, yes. But you can come back on Mon. I can't, though. Alex's eyes scanned the photos taped below the ledge of Moira's desk and spotted a woman in Winnie the Pooh scrubs. I'm in nursing school. At Albertus Magnus? Yeah. My niece is there. Allison Adams? Real pretty girl with red hair? That's her, Moira said with a smile. I can't miss class. They're so tough. I don't think I've ever been this tired. I know, Moira said ruefully. They're running alley ragged. I just... I need to be able to tell my mama I said goodbye to her. Tara's mom and dad were. They all weren't close. Alex was flat out guessing now but she suspected Moira Adams had her own story about girls like Tara Hutchins. If I could just see her face, say goodbye. Moira hesitated, then reached forward and gave her hand a squeeze. I can have someone take you down to see her. Just have your ID ready, Anne. It can be hard, but prayer helps. It always does, said Alex fervently. Moira pressed a button and a few minutes later an exhausted-looking coroner in blue scrubs appeared and waved Alex through. It was cold on the other side of the double doors, the floors tiled in heathered gray, the walls a melted cream. Sign in here, he said, gesturing to the clipboard on the wall. I'll need photo ID, cell phones, cameras, and all recording devices in the bin. You can retrieve them when you return. Sure, said Alex. Then she held out her hand, gold glinting beneath the fluorescence. I think you dropped this. The room was larger than she'd expected and ice cold. It was also unexpectedly noisy, the dripping of a faucet, the hum of the freezers, the rush of the air conditioner, though it was silent in another way. This was the last place Grace would come. To hell with Bellbaum. She should intern at the morgue this summer. The tables were metal, as were the basins and the hoses coiled above them, and the drawers, flat squares slotted into two of the walls like filing cabinets. Had hell lie been cut up in a place like this? It wasn't like the cause of death had been a mystery. Alex wished she had her coat. Or Dawes's parka. Or a shot of vodka. She needed to work fast. The compulsion would give her about thirty minutes to get her work done and get out. But it didn't take her long to find Tara, and though the drawer was heavier than she'd expected, it slid out smoothly. There was something worse about seeing her like this a second time, as if they knew each other. Looking at Tara now, Alex could see it had only been the blonde hair that made her think of Hell Lai. Hell Lai had been strong. Her body remembered the soccer and softball she'd played in high school, and she could surf and skateboard like a girl out of Seventeen magazine. This girl was built like Alex, ropey, but weak. Tara's knees looked brownish-gray. There was stubble near her bikini area, red razor bumps like a rash. She had a tattoo of a parrot at her hip, and below it was written Key West in looping scrawl. Her right arm had an ugly realistic portrait of a young girl on it. A daughter? A niece? Her own face as a child? There was a pirate flag and a ship on cresting waves, a Betty Page zombie girl in heels and black lingerie. The cameo on Tara's inner arm looked newer, the ink fresh and dark, though the text was nearly illegible in that tired gothic font, rather die than doubt. Song lyrics, but Alex couldn't remember what they were from. She wondered if her own tattoos would reappear if she died or if the art would live inside the address moths forever. Enough stalling. Alex took out her notes. The first part of the ritual was easy, a chant. Sang was saltito, but you couldn't just say the words, you had to sing them. It felt utterly obscene to do in that empty, echoing room 
but she made herself sing the chant, sang with saltito. Salire. Saltar. No tune was specified, only allegro. It was on her second round through that she realized she was singing the words to the tune of the Twizzler's jingle. So chewy. So fruity. So happy and oh so juicy. But if that's what it took to make the blood dance. She knew it was working when Tara's lips began to pink. Now things were going to get worse. The blood chant was only intended to start Tara's circulation and loosen rigor so that Alex could get her mouth open. Alex took hold of Tara's chin, trying to ignore the newly warm, pliant feel of her skin, and wiggled the girl's jaw open. She took the scarab from the plastic bag in her back pocket and placed it gently on Tara's tongue. Then she took the tin from her other pocket and began to trace waxy patterns over Tara's body with the bomb inside trying to think about anything but the dead skin beneath her fingertips. Feet, shins, ear, thighs, stomach, breasts, collarbone, down Tara's arms to her wrists and middle fingers. Finally, starting at the navel, she drew a line bisecting Tara's torso up to her throat, her chin, and to the crown of her head. Alex realized she'd forgotten to bring a lighter. She needed fire. There was a desk next to the door, beneath a messy whiteboard. The big drawers were locked, but the narrow top drawer slid open. A pink plastic lighter lay beside a pack of Marlboros. Alex took the lighter and held the flame just above the places she'd applied the bomb, retracing her path up Tara's body. As she did, a faint haze appeared over the skin, like heat rising off blacktop, the air seeming to wave and shimmer. The effect was denser in certain spots, so thick it blurred and vibrated as if seen through the spinning spokes of a wheel. Alex put the lighter back in the drawer. She reached out to the blur above Tara's elbow, ran her hand through the shimmer. In a rush, she was racing down the street on a bicycle. In front of her, a car door flew open in her path. She hit the brakes, failed to stop, struck the door at an angle, clipping her arm. Pain shot through her. Alex hissed and drew back her hand, cradling her arm as if the broken bone had been hers and not Tara's. The haze above Tara was a map of all the harm done to her body, flickers over her tattoos and where her ears had been pierced, dents clumping above her broken arm, a tiny dim spiral over a pockmark left by a BB on her cheek, the murky darkness that hung suspended over the wounds in her chest. In Lethe's books, Alex had found no way to make Tara talk or any way to reach her on the other side of the veil, at least, nothing that was achievable without the help of one of the societies. Even if Alex could have managed it, many of the rituals she'd found made it clear that speaking to the newly dead usually risked raising them, and that was always a dangerous proposition. No one could be brought back from beyond the veil permanently, and hauling a reluctant soul back into its body could be wildly unpredictable. Book and Snake specialized in necromancy and had created numerous safeguards for their rituals, but even they sometimes lost control once a gray found its way to a body. In the late 70s, they'd tried to summon the spirit of Jenny Kramer, the legendary belle of New Haven, into the body of a teenage girl from Camden, who had frozen to death when she'd passed out drunk in her car during a blizzard. Instead, it was the Camden girl who had returned, shivering with cold and possessed of the ferocious strength of the newly dead. She'd broken through the book and snake gates and walked to Yorkside Pizza, where she'd eaten two pies and then lain down in one of the ovens in an attempt to get warm. A Lethe delegate had been present and was able to quickly quarantine the area and, through a series of compulsions, convince the customers the girl was part of a performance art piece. The owner was Greek and less easily swayed. He had long carried a gory given to him by his mother, specifically the blue evil eye, or Maddie, which stymied any attempts at compulsion. Cash proved far more effective. At the owner's request, Lethe also stepped in to make sure Yorkside retained its lease when the majority of other businesses were forced out of Yale's premier shopping district by rising rents designed to bring in upscale retailers. 
the local businesses the Long Elm and Broadway had vanished, making way for prestige brands and chain stores, but Yorkside Pizza remained. So since Tara couldn't talk, her body would have to. Alex had discovered a ritual to reveal harm, something simpler, lighter, used for diagnosis or for when a patient or witness was unable to speak. It had been invented by Girolamo Frecastoro to discover who had poisoned an Italian countess after she'd keeled over, foaming at the mouth, at her own wedding feast. Alex didn't want to put her hand into the haze above the gruesome wounds on Tara's chest. But that was what she'd come here to do. She took a breath and thrust her fingers forward. She was on the ground, a boy's face above her, Lance. Sometimes she loved him but lately things had been. The thought left her. She felt herself open her mouth, tasted something acrid on her tongue. Lance was smiling. They were on their way, where? She felt only excitement, anticipation, the world beginning to blur. I'm sorry, Lance said. She was on her back, staring up at the sky. The streetlights seemed far away, everything was moving and the cathedral beside her melted into a building that blotted out the few stars. It was quiet, but she could hear something, like a boot squelching in mud. Thunk squelch, thunk squelch. She saw a body looming above her, saw the knife, understood the sound. Was her own blood and bone breaking open as the blade sawed away at her? Why didn't she feel it? What was real and what wasn't? Close your eyes, said an unfamiliar voice. She did and was gone. Alex stumbled backward, clutching her chest. She could still hear that horrible squelching sound, feel the warm wet spreading over her chest. But no pain? How had there been no pain? Had she been high? High enough not to feel being stabbed? Lance had drugged her first. He'd told her he was sorry. He must have been high too. So there was her answer. Tara and Lance had clearly been messing with something other than weed. No doubt by now Turner had been through their apartment, found whatever weird shit they were using and selling. Alex had no way of knowing what Lance had been thinking that night, but if he'd been taking some kind of hallucinogen it could be anything. Alex looked down at Tara's body. She'd been frightened in those last moments but she hadn't been hurting. That had to count for something. Lance would go to prison. There would be evidence. That amount of blood. Well, you couldn't hide it. Alex knew. The map still glowed above Terra. Little injuries. Big ones. What would Alex's map show? She'd never broken a bone, had surgery. But the worst damage didn't leave a mark. When Heli died, it was as if someone had cut into Alex's chest, cracked her open like balsa wood. What if it really had been like that and she'd had to walk down the street bleeding, trying to hold her ribs together, her heart and her lungs and every part of her open to the world? Instead, the thing that had broken her had left no mark, no scar for her to point to and say, this is where I ended. No doubt that was true for Tara too. There was more pain locked inside her that no glowing map would reveal. But though her wounds were grotesque, there were no organs taken, no blood marks or indications of magical harm. Tara had died because she'd been as stupid as Alex and no one had come to rescue her in time. She hadn't found Jesus or yoga, and no one had offered her a scholarship to Yale. It was time to leave. She had her answers. This should be enough to appease Helly's memory and Darlington's judgment too. But something was still tugging at her, that sense of familiarity she'd felt at the crime scene that had nothing to do with Tara's blonde hair or the sad, parallel tracks of their lives. Should we go, she asked the coroner standing in the corner in his scrubs, looking vaguely at nothing. Whatever you like, he said. Alex closed the drawer. I think I'd like to sleep for eighteen hours, Alex said on a sigh. Walk me out and tell Moira everything went fine. She opened the door and strolled straight into Detective Abel Turner. 
he seized her arm and drove her backward into the room, slamming the door behind him. What the living fuck do you think you're doing? Hey! Alex said cheerfully. You made it. The coroner hovered behind him. Are we going? he asked. Stay there a minute, said Alex. Turner, you're gonna want to let go of me. You don't tell me what I want. And what the hell is wrong with him? He's having a good night, said Alex, her heart pounding in her chest. Abel Turner did not lose his cool. He was always smiling, always calm. But something in Alex liked him better this way. Did you lay hands on that girl, he said, fingers digging into her skin. Her body is evidence and you're tampering with it. That's a crime. Alex thought about kneeing Turner in the nuts, but that wasn't what you did with the cop, so she went limp. Completely limp. It was a strategy she'd learned to use with Len. What the hell? He tried to hold her up as she slumped against him, then released her. What is wrong with you? He wiped his hand on his arm as if her weakness were catching. Plenty, Alex said. She managed to right herself before she actually fell, making sure to stay out of his reach. What kind of stuff were Tara and Lance getting into? I beg your pardon? She thought of Lance's face floating above her. I'm sorry. What had they been using that final night together? What were they dealing? Acid? Molly? I know it wasn't just pot. Turner's eyes narrowed, his old, smooth demeanor slipping back into place. Like everything else related to this case, that is none of your business. Were they dealing to students? To the societies? They had a long roster. Who? Turner shook his head. Let's go. Now. He reached for her arm, but she sidestepped him. You can stay here, Alex told the coroner. The handsome detective Turner will see me out. What did you do to him? Turner muttered as they stepped into the hall. Freaky shit. This isn't a joke, Miss Stern. As he hustled her down the hall, Alex said, I'm not doing this for fun either, you get that? I don't like being Dante. You don't like being Centurion, but these are our jobs and you're screwing it up for both of us. Turner looked slightly put out by that. Of course, it wasn't really true. Sando had told her to stand down. Rest easy. They stepped into the waiting room. Dawes was nowhere to be seen. I told your friend to wait in the car, said Turner. At least she has the sense to know when she fucks up. And not a single warning. Dawes was a crap lookout. Moira Adams smiled from the desk. You get your moment, Han? Alex nodded. I did. Thank you. I'll have your family in my prayers. Good night, Detective Turner. You do some freaky shit to her too? Turner asked as they stepped into the cold. Alex rubbed her arms miserably. She wanted her coat. Didn't have to. I told Sando I'd keep him up to date. If I thought any of the young psychopaths under your care were connected, I would be pursuing it. Alex believed that. There could be things you're not seeing. There's nothing to see. Her boyfriend was arrested near the scene. Their neighbors heard some ugly arguments the last few weeks. There's blood evidence linking him to the crime. He had powerful hallucinogens in his system. What exactly? We're not sure yet. Alex had stayed away from any kind of hallucinogen after she realized they just made the greys more terrifying but she'd held plenty of hands during good and bad trips and she had yet to meet the mushroom that could make you feel like you weren't being stabbed to death. Do you want him to get away with it? Turner said. What? The question startled her. You tampered with a corpse. Tara's body is evidence. If you mess around with this case enough, it could mean Lance Gressing doesn't go away for this. 
Do you want that? No, Alex said. He doesn't get away with it. Turner nodded. Good. They stood in the cold. Alex could see the old Mercedes idling in the lot, one of the only remaining cars. Dawes's face was a dim smudge behind the windshield. She raised her hand in what Alex realized was a limp wave. Thanks, Pammy. It was long past time to let this go. Why couldn't she? She tried one last play. Just give me a name. Lethe will find out eventually. If the societies are messing around with illegal substances, we should know. And then we can move on to kidnapping, insider trading, and... Did cutting someone open to read their innards fall under assault? They'd need a whole new section of the penal code to cover what the societies dabbled in. We can investigate without stepping on your murder case. Turner sighed, his breath pluming white in the cold. There was only one society name in her contacts. Trip Helmuth. We're in the process of clearing him. I saw him last night. He's a bones man. He was working the door at a prognostication. That's what he said. Was he there the whole night? I don't know, she admitted. Trip had been banished to the hallway to stand guard. It was true that once a ritual started, People rarely went in or out, only when someone got faint or sick or if something had to be fetched for the Harrisbex. Alex thought she remembered the door opening and closing a few times, but she couldn't be certain. She'd been worrying about the chalk circle and trying not to vomit. But it was hard to believe Trip could have skipped out on the ritual, gotten all the way to Payne Whitney, murdered Tara, and gotten back on duty without anyone knowing. Besides, what homicidal beef could he have with Tara? Trip was rich enough to buy himself out of any kind of trouble Tara or her boyfriend might have tried to make for him, and it wasn't Trip's face Alex had seen hovering above Tara with a knife. It was Lance's. Do not talk to him, Turner said. I'll send you and the dean the info once we lock in his alibi. You stay away from my case. And away from your career? That's right. The next time I find you anywhere you're not supposed to be, I'll arrest you on the spot. Alex couldn't help the dark bubble of laughter that burst from her. You're not going to arrest me, Detective Turner. The last place you want me is in a police station, making noise. I'm messy and Lethe is messy and all you want is to get through this without our mess getting on those expensive shoes. Turner gave her a long, steady look. I don't know how you ended up here, Ms. Stern, but I know the difference between quality goods and what I find on the bottom of my shoe, and you're most definitely not quality. Thanks for the talk, Turner. Alex leaned in, knowing the stink of the uncanny was radiating off her in heavy waves. She gave him her sweetest, warmest smile. And don't grab me like that again. I may be shit, but I'm the kind that sticks.